What's up guys, it's your boy Om Sensei. Welcome to What If Zoro Was Reborn in JJK as Toji's Son, Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed already. Also, remember to check out the original story, linked in the description. Consider joining my Patreon to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. I should have taken a taxi. Toji naturally caught Zoro by the nape of his neck as he tried to veer off onto a different path, pulling him back to his side. This was the eighth time he had to do so. A few hours earlier, when Zoro mentioned he wanted to show his power what he called hockey Toji had asked. Can't you show it here? It's a bit problematic to show it at home or in crowded places. It would be better to find a place with fewer people. Following that, Toji took Zoro out of the house after the nanny arrived, heading to a suitable location. Of course, he hadn't anticipated getting lost so frequently on a journey that should have taken about 30 minutes by foot. Does he have no sense of direction at all? Toji seriously wondered. Zoro, make sure to take a taxi if you're going somewhere. Why? Because you're directionally challenged. Why after watching Zoro attempt to enter dead end alleys three times in a row, Toji was convinced. Zoro was severely directionally challenged. Have you never been around here? I have. How many times? Hard to say. What were you doing? looking for you. Zoro's response made Toji close his mouth. Carrying a heavy sense of guilt, he felt diminished in front of his child. Toji, once again, saw Zoro trying to wander off into a secluded alley and massaged his temples. No helping it. Toji grabbed Zoro by the nape of his neck and hoisted him up onto his shoulders. Zoro, suddenly finding himself in a piggyback position, looked bewildered. What's this? If you keep walking like that, you'll get lost. Stay put. I can walk on my own. Toji ignored Zoro's kicking feet as he continued walking. The body perched on his shoulder was small and light. Four years old. The weight felt true to the age. With this body, his son had killed someone yesterday. Zoro. Hmm? Yesterday, you killed someone. I did. There wasn't much emotion in his response. Since Zoro started wandering the East Blue in search of Meg, he had killed quite a few people. To the bloodthirsty monsters, the people of the East Blue would murmur about him. What people said about him didn't matter, not really. Was it your first time? Well in this life, yes. Zaro swallowed the rest of his words. Toji was silent for a moment. The one killed had hesitated, and Zaro, being quite skilled, wouldn't just kill anyone but still, murder was murder. Toji couldn't bring himself to ask how it had happened. He feared the answer might be, you weren't there. He feared his absence had cornered Zaro into a dead end. So, Toji asked something else. Are you okay? When Toji first committed murder, he was 17. It was his first assignment after leaving the Zenin family, and his target was a class 2 sorcerer. Toji had hidden in the sorcerer's residence in advance, ambushed him, and cut his throat. As the sorcerer's head fell to the ground, a whirlwind of emotions swept through Toji's mind. An instinctual repulsion to murder, doubt over whether he was truly dead, a base thrill and pleasure that even someone as blessed as the sorcerer ended up dead by the hands of someone like him, a realization that he could never go back to the past. Even Toji, of all people, felt such things during his first kill. But Zoro, he seemed unnervingly unfazed. After all, Toji was 17 at the time, and Zoro is now only 4. Even those in the sorcery world who are put through rigorous training to become strong sorcerers from a young age, don't usually take on the task of killing people at 4. It wouldn't be strange for them to cry and make a fuss no, that would be the expected reaction at that age. There might be more insane people in the sorcery world than sane ones, but even considering that, Zaro was excessively calm. Zaro blinked. Who? Me? Yes. I'm okay. A sword is a weapon made to kill. From the moment he first held one, aspiring to reach the pinnacle as a swordsman, he was prepared to accumulate the karma of killing, and to pay its price. Though Toji wouldn't know. Silently looking down at Toji's head, Zaro suddenly asked. Afraid? Of what? Me. He knew it might seem strange. But it was only a matter of time before it was revealed, just a bit earlier than expected. After all, Zaro was such a person. A swordsman who finds exhilaration in battle and, while avoiding indiscriminate killing, feels little for the death of an enemy. No matter how Toji reacted to Zaro, there was no intention of leaving him. But, as with the people of the East Blue in the past, if Toji were to avoid and fear Zoro no. Toji quickly responded. It's not you that I'm afraid of. Regardless of what he was, Zaro was Toji's son. That's why Toji was not afraid of him. How he acquired such power was a mystery. Being a sorcerer killer himself, Toji was not so faint-hearted as to be scared of his son for killing a sorcerer. He was absolutely not afraid. It's just that he was worried about you, Zaro. 
That was all there was to it. I'm sorry. If he hadn't left in the first place, Zaro wouldn't have encountered the sorcerer. And after doing so, Toji couldn't be shameless enough to question his son about killing a sorcerer. Looking at the back of Toji's head for a moment, Zaro snorted and said. I'm okay. He really was okay. The time to be shocked by killing had long passed. Don't leave again. Toji sighed, hesitating before continuing. Don't just kill anyone recklessly. It's difficult to manage, you know. A sword that only brings destruction is not a strong sword. I know, so don't worry. Where did such a person come from? What a question, he came from me. Toji closed his mouth and walked on. Upon reaching their destination, Toji carefully set Zoro down on the ground. We've arrived. They were in front of a tightly locked iron gate at the back of a massive building. Toji, with practiced ease, began unlocking the entrance and spoke up. Is hockey the name of the technique you possess? What's a technique? It was from that moment, Toji felt the urge to smack his forehead with his palm. Watching Toji struggle to explain, Zaro spoke up. Just show me first, then I'll ask questions. Right, Zaro had mentioned showing it. It wasn't too late to judge after seeing it. As the door opened, a wide space similar to a hall was revealed. It was filled with dust due to a lack of human presence for a long time. The walls and floor bore marks of being slashed or pierced by something sharp. This place was once owned by a sorcerer who Toji had been hired to kill. The sorcerer, who enjoyed creating cursed objects, often tested the performance of his creations here. After killing the sorcerer, Toji had quietly taken over the place with the help of Xu Kong, and often came here to test new cursed objects. Next is math, arithmetic time Toji clicked his tongue upon hearing the sound of a frog spirit slithering along the wall. It seemed a spirit had crawled in after leaving the place vacant for too long. Though it was only a third-class spirit. Good timing. Zaro stepped forward briskly, fixing his gaze on the spirit. It's easier to show when there's a target. You can see it, then. You're blessed, too. While Toji was engulfed in a mix of joy and alienation, Zaro shook his head lightly. I can't see it with my eyes. It's about sensing. Zaro walked up confidently to stand in front of Toji. The power of hockey manifests from the essence of the mind, or more accurately, the will, that every living being possesses. Well, the color of the Supreme King is something one is born with. Anyway, there are mainly three types of hockey. Observation hockey, Kenbin Shoku, Armament hockey, Buza Shoku, and Conqueror's hockey, Hashoku. The third class spirit noticed Zoro and fell from the wall with a thud. It landed on the floor and then bounced towards him. First, the observation hockey, Kenbin Shoku hockey. As the spirit directed its hostility towards Zoro, Toji instinctively tensed up, ready to strike it down. That would have been the case if Zoro hadn't been clearly tracking the spirit's movements with his eyes. It's the power to feel the presence of others more strongly. Zaro closed his eyes. Experiment? SSSSH. The frog spirit extended its long, filthy tongue towards Zoro's head. With a simple tilt of his head, Zaro dodged the attack. Toji watched, somewhat dazed, as Zoro easily avoided the spirit's attacks with mere head movements, as if mocking it. Reflexes? No, he knew. He knew where the spirit would strike. Enraged, the frog spirit lashed out its tongue like a whip. Zaro easily sidestepped it with a few movements. Bang. 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 You can know where your opponent is, how strong they are, and where they will attack. It's not magic, nor is it simply a physical ability being enhanced. Toji instinctively realized this hockey was a power unlike any he had encountered before. The second is armament hockey, Buzushoku hockey. It's like wearing invisible armor around your body. Poof. Zoro's right hand was enveloped in armament hockey, turning it jet black. When you wear armament hockey, the covered part turns black. And the strength and defense of that area increase according to the intensity of the hockey. A punch with just bare fists hurts, but a punch with armament hockey hurts more, and also offers better protection. You can also apply it to weapons. Zoro drew a short dagger he was wearing around his neck. The armament hockey from his hand transferred to the dagger, turning it jet black. Moreover, armament hockey can grab the essence. The frog spirit tilted its head in confusion. With a light swing, its tongue was sliced in half and fell to the ground. Screeching in pain, the spirit realized its tongue had been cut and started hopping madly. No. Hate it. Stronger armament hockey can attack without even touching. Like this. Zoro extended his hand. The frog spirit, as if to crush Zoro's hand, leapt high. Boom. Without their bodies touching, a powerful wave of armament hockey was released like a blast, obliterating the spirit on the spot without a chance to react. Lastly, there's conqueror's hockey, but I can't show that yet. Even if one is born with Conqueror's Hockey, the ability to use it depends on the strength of one's spirit and body. Until it manifests, those who possess Conqueror's Hockey may not even realize it. 
In Zoro's case, while his spirit was strong enough, his body still had a way to go. These three are the basics of hockey. Zoro turned back to Toji. Toji wore an incredibly strange expression. It was as if he had just seen a small elephant grow wings and fly into the sky astonished, questioning the reality before his eyes and wondering if he was dreaming. Why that look? Toji clutched his head. Although the explanation wasn't particularly lengthy, it was enough to make his head feel like it was going to burst. The two types of hockey Zoro demonstrated were remarkably simple. Observation hockey, which senses the presence of others, and armament hockey, which grabs onto the essence of an opponent, enhancing both attack and defense. However, simplicity does not equate to weakness. In fact, during his life as a sorcerer killer, Toji found that the most troublesome sorcerers he faced were not those with complex techniques, but those with simple ones. If a technique is simple and predictable, the user often compensates by increasing its power to an unavoidable level or by honing their physical abilities and crisis management skills. Zoro effortlessly dodged a grade 3 spirits attack as if he could see it coming and detected Toji's presence behind him, something only Satoru Goho could notice. He easily captured a spirit that could not be hit without a certain power and managed to fight against at least a grade 3 sorcerer and a grade 3 spirit without a single injury. The first and second instances were due to observation hockey and the third and fourth, armament hockey. At least, Zaro could apply it to that extent. How he could do so at his age is beyond me. Likely, he's capable of even more. Above all Toji recalled the sight of the spirit bursting lifelessly. Zaro's hand hadn't touched the spirit at all. Is it possible to strike without touching? Upon hearing that, a single technique came to mind for Toji. A supreme defensive technique that slows down anything approaching, ultimately preventing it from ever touching. A technique of such complexity in its application that only those with a special sight could properly use it, truly the strongest technique. Mucogen, limitless. Could this technique be penetrated? Questions tangled in his mouth like a ball of yarn, unable to come out. After a long while, he finally managed to speak. How did you acquire this hockey? I learned it. From whom? My master and my enemies. Enemies? Zaro smirked. Don't worry, I won because I won. Recalling the moment he defeated that person always felt good, no matter how many times he did it. After all, it was the moment Zoro had taken his place as the strongest. And that guy won't be coming here. How Zoro was born into this world as a baby, even he didn't know. However, even if Meik had died in that world, Zoro thought the chances of Meik being reborn in this world were extremely low. I'm an exception. He knew intuitively. Dying in that world and being reborn as a baby in another world, like Zoro, was a very rare occurrence. While Toji kept in mind the existence of Zoro's master and enemy, he muttered absentmindedly. You learned it? It's not something you're born with? Some are born with it. The conqueror's hockey is something you're born with, not something you can gain through training or learning. Observation hockey, too, sometimes is inherited from parents or one is born with it. However, it doesn't mean that those who are born with observation hockey are superior to those who acquire it later in life. After all, hockey truly develops in life-threatening, extreme situations. Can anyone learn it? No. Hockey is ultimately the power of will. Without a strong inner will, no amount of training can enable someone to use it. Conversely, without training, even those with a strong will cannot acquire it. Toji asked eagerly. What about me? Well, that depends on you. There are those who cannot awaken it despite receiving the best teachings, and those who can awaken it, even with the vaguest of instructions. The key factor is how strong that person's will is. If you want, I'll teach you. He was planning to teach Megumi when he grew a little more. Regardless of the path Megumi chooses, he must be able to protect himself. Teach me? Toji pressed his hand against his forehead. His head was spinning. The numerous instances of contempt and violence he had endured while with that damned clan flashed before his eyes like a panorama. A powerless monkey. That's what the Zenin clan members called him. He lacked the innate power that every human, even animals to some extent, possessed. Not born with it and now, before his very eyes, the ability known as hockey had appeared. It wasn't an innate power that those not born with could never obtain, regardless of their efforts. Instead, it was a capability that even those not born with it could fully acquire through effort to power, that could rival a sorcerer's innate abilities and techniques. Can I, possess it too? Toji swallowed the rest of his words. It was too degrading a question to ask in front of his son. Having hockey doesn't make you invincible. If there's an attacker ability that can surpass hockey, then a user of hockey can still lose to someone who hasn't mastered it. If a fighter as strong as Toji were to attack Zoro with the intent to kill, even with Zoro's strong hockey, it would be a difficult fight. Also, since hockey fundamentally relies on willpower, if that will falters, its power diminishes. Armament hockey weakens, and observation hockey loses its sharpness. 
Thus, maintaining an unwavering mind, Fudishin, is very important for a hockey user. Emotional disturbance can significantly weaken their power in an instant. Having regained some composure, Toji asked, where are this teacher and enemy who taught you this power now? Well, it would be difficult for you to meet them. Kaushiru would be at the Shimatsuki village dojo, and Mehik probably roaming alone on his boat shaped like a giant coffin, decimating unfortunate fleets. Of course, both would be in the world of their past lives, not this one. They're definitely not in this country. With that, Toji seemed to relax, yet there was a hint of disappointment. Seeing this, Zaro twitched an eyebrow. If you're thinking of learning from them, forget it. My hockey is stronger. Besides, Kaushiru isn't even a hockey user. He just knows about hockey. Besides your master and enemy, anyone else knows about hockey? Probably just me. That seemed likely. Whether liked or not, those with strange powers inevitably end up in the world of sorcery. If there were others with such a power, Toji would have surely heard about it. Or he would have encountered them as enemies by now. There was still much he wanted to say, but it felt like it could go on endlessly. Toji opened his mouth several times, then closed it again. He had already learned too much today, he planned to learn more gradually. Don't tell anyone else about it. Got it. If you have anything you want to ask me, go ahead. Naturally, Toji thought Zoro would ask about spirits, innate powers, or techniques. Without Toji, Zoro had faced spirits without even knowing what they were, so he must be curious about their nature. He never imagined such a question would come. About Chie's grave. Can you tell me where it is? He wanted to visit but didn't know where it was. The question, asked with a calm face, made Toji feel as if a hot ball was stuck in his throat. I'll write down the address for you. Is it far from home? You can't walk there. It was a lie. It wasn't very far. But if he let Zoro go alone, he'd definitely get lost 100% of the time. They could go together, I'll go with you as far as the entrance. Toji clenched his fist tightly, feeling nauseous. It was ridiculous for someone with zero and eight power to feel like this, as if he had a stomach upset. He still couldn't visit that place. Not yet. Are you going to come into the cemetery with me? No. Okay. Let's go together someday. Zaro's response was calm, as if he had anticipated Toji's answer. Toji couldn't reply. The next day, a bouquet of white flowers was placed on Xie's grave. November passed, and December came. Well, to say it came might be a bit misleading. It's already mid-December. Zaro finally flipped over the calendar that was still on November. Behind the November page, the December calendar was revealed. So, it's winter now. It had gotten a bit colder, but honestly, he couldn't really feel it. The Tokyo where Zoro lived didn't get very cold in winter, and it hardly ever snowed. Winter Island was covered in snow. And it was incredibly cold there. What are you doing, son? Toji, who had walked out of his room yawning, asked Zoro. Zoro just shrugged. Nothing much. Just thinking it doesn't snow much here in winter. Zoro muttered. Snow doesn't really fall in Tokyo. If you want to see snow, you have to go to a different region. Is that so? It was different from his past life, where the climate was generally similar across the same island. Of course, in his past life, there were places like Punk Hazard, where one half was blazing hot and the other was freezing cold, but that was because of the battle between Akainu and Akiji. Achu. At the sound from behind them, Zaro and Toji immediately turned around. Megumi was sitting on the floor, sniffling. Is he cold? Zaro pulled out a yellow blanket with dinosaurs on it and draped it over Megumi. Thwack, Megumi threw the blanket towards Toji's face. Toji caught the blanket before it hit him, and naturally covered Megumi with it again, saying, come to think of it, isn't your brother's birthday around this time? December 22nd. Try to remember. Zaro chided him. In five days, it would be Megumi's first birthday. What was my first birthday like? Zaro tried to recall. He had slept for about half of the day, and for the other half, he watched Chia and Toji moving back and forth in front of him. There was a lot of food, but not much that Zoro could eat. The most fun part was definitely when Chia put a headband with teddy bear ears on Toji's head. Maybe I should put that on Toji again this time. It seemed like it would be fun. Zoro smirked, a mysterious chill causing Toji to rub his goosebump-covered forearms. Let's go buy a present for Megumi. Sure, after we do that. Today, after all. Toji and Zoro's gazes clashed in the air. Today was the one day a week when Toji received hockey training from Zoro. After Zoro showed his hockey to Toji, Toji began receiving hockey training from Zoro once a week. There were a few reasons for doing it only once a week. First, Zoro showed signs of exhaustion after concentrating on using hockey for several days in a row. No matter how skilled in hockey he was or how fast he was growing, Zoro was still a child. Just concentrating could make his head hot, and he would get tired easily. 
One day was fine, but using hockey for several days in a row would wear him out even if he pretended otherwise. He needed time for his mental fatigue to recover. Second, they couldn't leave Megumi alone for too long. Of course, they wouldn't leave Megumi alone at home when they went out for training. After much persuasion, they managed to hire a decent nanny. Still, Zaro was extremely reluctant to leave Megumi at home. Third, ironically, was because of something the new nanny said to Toji. The eldest son is still a child. Please treat him as such. This nanny, unlike the previous ones, was a middle-aged woman who showed equal concern for both Megumi and Zaro. She was afraid of Toji, but when it came to matters concerning Zoro or Megumi, she would forget her fear and confront him. Especially memorable was what she said when Toji returned home carrying a sleepy Zoro who had fallen asleep during their training. The eldest son is at an age where it's natural for him to run around excitedly and then suddenly fall asleep. I don't know what you're teaching him when you take him out, but it's too early. A child needs to be allowed to be a child. Unable to say that it was Zoro who was doing the teaching, Toji just listened silently. A child, hot today, we're going to focus on training observation hockey. Toji looked at Zoro standing in front of him, his face the epitome of seriousness. So. They're telling me to treat such a child as a child. Observation hockey, huh Toji's voice trailed off. He still hadn't gotten the hang of hockey. I can't use it yet. Zoro snorted. What are you talking about after only a month of training? Of course, you can't. Considering that Toji only received direct training from Zoro once a week, it was natural that Toji hadn't yet mastered hockey. Hockey is hard to learn. Zoro himself needed two years of training to freely wield hockey. Those two years involved almost daily duels with Mick, catching groups of monkeys that attacked him with swords, and doing strength training. So, it was only natural that Toji couldn't use hockey yet. It's hard enough to realize that you possess hockey, and even if you do, some people die without ever being able to draw it out. Of course, Zoro had no intention of letting Toji end up like that. Sit down. As Toji sat down, Zoro unwrapped the bandana he was wearing around his arm and tied it over Toji's eyes. What are you doing? Your senses are too good. How so? Because your senses and physical abilities are so sharp, you unconsciously try to rely on them instead of hockey. Toji's senses weren't just limited to sight, his touch, smell, hearing, taste essentially, all his senses were exceptionally keen. Additionally, his physical abilities were well-balanced and superior, so instead of trying to use observation hockey when an attack came, he would just dodge it using his physical abilities and senses. That's not a bad thing. Trying not to use his excellent physical abilities and senses at all would be more of a loss. However, the problem was trying to rely solely on them. That's why Zoro intended to somewhat disrupt Toji's senses. If he relied only on his physical abilities and senses, and someday faced an opponent with superior physical abilities, or received an attack that couldn't be predicted with Toji's senses and physique, you'd be taken down in an instant. Who would? You would. After patting Toji's body, inserting earplugs into his ears, and meticulously applying Vaseline under his nose, Zoro picked up a stick lying nearby. With a swift motion, Zoro's hand and the stick turned pitch black with armament hockey. I aim for your upper body, so try to dodge while sitting. Wait, whoosh. Feeling the wind brush past his nose, Toji reflexively tilted his neck back. The stick sliced through the air where his head had been. Moreover, the power behind it, did you coat it with hockey? Yeah. I thought you wouldn't feel threatened by a mere stick. Toji recalled the last week when Zoro had emitted armament hockey outward. He muttered, remembering the sight of a sandbag, more than a meter away, bursting open from the impact of the hockey, its contents scattering in all directions. Feels like I could die if I get hit. I don't have that level of power yet. It would hurt, though. Zaro swung the stick through the air. You knew it was coming because of the wind, right? Focus on sensing me and the stick, not just the wind. Whoosh. As the stick once again narrowly missed his shoulder, Toji thought if he didn't learn observation hockey today, his head might actually crack open. Toji stood in the toy store within the department store, rubbing the back of his head with a dazed expression. He had ended up getting hit by Zoro during their training. Around the Christmas tree, set up prematurely, were boxes wrapped in sparkling paper. They were just for decoration, not containing any real gifts. Mommy, mommy. Buy me a bunny doll. I want a robot. Several children dashed inside, shouting their wishes. Toji surveyed the toy store. There were kids scampering among shelves packed with toys, a little girl tugging at her mother's skirt pointing at the toy she wanted, and a boy holding two toys, unable to decide, eventually lying down in front of his dad in defeat. Meanwhile, Zaro was calmly examining toys in the section for zero to one year olds. Toji remembered what the nanny had said. Treat him like a child. But. He wondered if there was a need to treat someone who had just been training by swinging a stick at his father's head and then said, you're finally improving. 
Practice more, like a child. However, it was true that Zoro was a child. Do you want me to buy you something from here? I don't need anything. Then is there something you want? A sword. A sword? Yeah. Three of them. I practice Sant or you. Toji rubbed his mouth with a look that said he had a lot to say. How are you going to hold all three? I'll hold one in my mouth. And your mouth are you serious? He felt the urge to sigh. How am I supposed to treat a kid talking about using three swords like a child? The fact that Zoro wanted to use three swords seemed childish, showing a lack of understanding of the world. But the problem was that Zoro might not just talk about it, he seemed likely to actually attempt it. Toji effortlessly lifted Zoro and placed him in the front seat of the cart. I'll choose, so you take a break. You don't know Megumi well enough. Silenced by the heavy truth, Toji remained quiet. Although it had been a month since he returned home, the absolute time he had spent taking care of Megumi was still less than Zoro's. Megumi also seemed to prefer Zoro over Toji. I'll just buy it. Toji, you Zoro stopped mid-sentence and sharply turned his head. His eyes narrowed as he stared at a corner of a shelf. Following Zoro's gaze, Toji spotted a spirit. A green, squirming spirit was clinging to the toy shelf. Can't buy, can't you why, sorry, why, why? Toji clicked his tongue in annoyance. This was the problem with crowded places. I told you not to look. The spirit spread its wings and flew towards Zoro. Toji pulled a small wooden pocket knife from his pocket and swung it at the spirit rushing towards Zoro at an unseen speed. Swoosh. The spirit was sliced in half in midair and fell. Zoro looked back at Toji with a look of dissatisfaction. I could have taken it down. If you have a complaint, then be faster than me. I guess I'll have to be, huh? Considering whether he should increase his training, Zoro pondered seriously, oblivious to Toji shaking his head in disapproval. I told you, don't make eye contact. Spirits will attack if they think they are being watched. Hmm, should I walk around with my eyes closed? Or wear sunglasses? Just as Zoro had taught Toji about hockey, Toji had been teaching Zoro about sorcery. The irony of a non-sorcerer like Toji teaching sorcery was not lost on him, but what choice did he have? There was no one else to teach Zoro. Zoro's existence couldn't be carelessly revealed to the sorcerer community. If it were, he would undoubtedly become a target. In the largely abnormal realm of sorcery, Zoro's existence was exceptionally unique, in more ways than one. Learning hockey had revealed something important. It was a skill that couldn't be learned without instruction, yet even with teaching, very few actually managed to use it. Ordinary non-sorcerers would find it even harder to obtain. For Toji, who was adept in physical combat and had struggled for a month without grasping it, it would be nearly impossible for ordinary non-sorcerers. They were usually not accustomed to fighting. Only sorcerers, specifically those active and familiar with combat, not just retired elders hiding in the back rooms, could perhaps attempt to acquire the skill. Of course, even for them, tremendous effort and time would be required. Acquiring the skill was just a beginning. To increase proficiency and apply hockey effectively, something more was needed. Although Zoro hadn't explained what that was, Toji intuitively understood that simply time and effort were not enough to enhance proficiency in hockey. Zoro said he had learned hockey. When could he possibly have had the time? And when had he left the house? While I was away? Even considering that, the timeline seemed too short. To master all of this in just a bit over half a year? The more Toji delved into hockey, the more unanswered questions accumulated in his mind. How could Zoro have such a high proficiency in hockey at such a young age? Where did he hear about hockey? When did he start training in hockey? How could he have such an unwavering mind, Fudishin, at his age? Why did he seem familiar with combat and injuries? How did he attain a maturity rivaling adults at the tender age of four? All these questions ultimately converged into one. Zoro, my son. What kind of being are you? Father. Roused from his thoughts by Zoro's call, Toji noticed Zoro pointing at a box containing a quaint little drum in the front seat of the cart. How about this? I think Megumi would like it. What is it? It's a drum that plays songs when pressed. Different songs play depending on where you press. The house would be filled with the sound of music. Toji was opposed to the idea. Yet, seeing Zoro's genuinely joyful face, he found himself unable to say no. Zoro took a headband with pig ears attached from the shelf. And this too. And why that? Because it was funny when you wore it. Is this Marimo my child? Toji felt irritated, but the sight of the small, round, green head cooled his anger. A sigh escaped him. Do as you like. Then, we're getting this too. Toji watched with disapproval as Zoro tossed the pig ears headband into the cart. I thought she was the only one who could get me to wear something like that. Toji suddenly realized. For the first time since that day, he thought of Chia without sadness or grief. Unconsciously, he placed his hand over his heart. Pain slowly spread as his heartbeat began to quicken, a pain that was both agonizing and somewhat reassuring. Nothing much had changed. 
He still hadn't visited Jie's grave, thinking of Jie still hurt, sometimes Megumi's spiky hair reminded him of her, and it inevitably dampened his mood, and looking into Zoro's eyes, identical to hers, made his heart sink. Someday, Toji would think of Jie again. Many times it would hurt, but someday, like now, he would remember her without any pain. And as time passed, those moments would become more frequent. Whether it was a bad thing or a good thing, Toji couldn't decide. Chia was Zen and Toji's first salvation, his love. Father. Toji barely turned his eyes to look at Zoro, who asked with his usual calm gray eyes. Do you want anything for yourself? Like what? Your birthday is coming up too, dad. Soon it's your birthday, Toji. The words overlapped. The words from his son in front of him and those from the person he loved most. Feeling dizzy, Toji covered his eyes with one hand. Nothing. Knowing Zoro was looking at him, Toji couldn't bring himself to lower his hand. Then he heard Zoro's calm voice. Then let's go back. All right. Toji felt a small warmth touch the hand that was gripping the cart handle tightly. The small hand that gently touched the back of his own made Toji smile unwittingly. Such a kind child. And strong too. In many ways, he was more than Toji deserved. The same went for Megumi. He lowered the arm that had been covering his eyes and used it to ruffle Zoro's hair. It felt prickly, like touching a ball made of grass. Zoro was not like any child, and what he truly was, was still unclear. Growing up too fast, already knowing too much, there was little Toji could teach him. Rather, it was Toji who often received lessons from Zoro, and there wasn't much he had given or could give. But the fact that Zoro was Toji's son remained unchanged. Thank you. Zoro nodded his head vigorously. Let's go, home. Then he pointed towards the path leading to the no-entry area for unauthorized personnel. Toji found himself laughing. At least bringing this directionally challenged Marimo home was something he could do. On his first birthday, Megumi excitedly banged on the drum he received as a gift at home. Kaya. Megumi hit the drum so vigorously that the music never reached its end, constantly changing midway. Fortunately, since it was designed for babies, the sound wasn't loud, but it was still chaotic. Zoro seemed bothered by the noise, his expression slightly furrowed. See, I knew this would happen. Toji, fiddling with the cumbersome pig ears headband, thought indifferently. Ani. Megumi extended the drum towards Zoro. Resigned, Zoro began to play the drum alongside Megumi. Focused solely on the drum, the carefully prepared birthday meal began to cool off. Woo. Woo. Megumi, calm down a bit ah, that tickles. Trying to encourage him to hit harder, Megumi stuck his hand inside Zoro's shirt and tickled him. However, for Zoro, who could even deflect a baton from Toji, Megumi's fingers only tickled. Papa. Papa. When Megumi called, Toji approached him, feeling as if he were walking towards his inevitable doom. Then, following Megumi's lead, he tapped the drum with his palm. Despite his exceptional hearing as a sorcerer screaming in dissonance, he just endured it. Do. Do. Let's calm down now, Megumi. Megumi? Ani. Toji played the drum absent-mindedly. It was noisy, but it was a better birthday than a quiet one. When Zoro opened his eyes, he saw Toji's face sleeping in front of him. As soon as he realized Toji was sleeping beside him, Zoro immediately closed his eyes again and deliberately breathed evenly as if he were asleep. Toji was sensitive when asleep, approaching too closely or staring for too long would wake him. Fortunately, it seemed he hadn't awakened, as Zoro could hear Toji's feigned breathing by his ear. For some reason, Toji's presence was particularly faint. It wasn't a fact that Zoro particularly liked. After all, he could confirm it with his observation hockey. The rustling sound of breathing came from within his arms. It was Megumi. Megumi's new fluffy winter pajamas brushed against Zoro's arm. Whether it was the cold or just a desire to snuggle, Megumi made a whining sound and gradually moved closer into Zoro's embrace. Zoro wriggled his arms to wrap them around Megumi's body. Once fully embraced, Megumi seemed content, stopped fussing, and fell into a peaceful sleep. Russell. Hearing the sound of Toji getting up, Zoro opened his eyes in a flash. Toji, who was sitting up, pressed down on Zoro's head with his hand. Sleep more. I'm already awake. Toji chuckled at Zoro, who was carefully getting up so as not to wake Megumi. You're tender. I guess not sure. Childcare felt like an endless battle, no matter how much you cut through it. He was trying his best, but whether he was doing well remained uncertain. Am I doing it right? Zoro looked at Megumi's rounded belly. Underneath the thick pajamas lay a significant innate power, quietly contained. Megumi's power was like water in a bottle, not leaking out at all. What's wrong? Just thinking about the innate power. Compared to the innate power that non-sorcerers possess, a sorcerer's is incomparably greater, just as they say. Sorcerers are all affiliated with the Jujutsu headquarters, tasked with killing spirits and curse users, Toji stated. Yeah. 
or they become curse users themselves, Zaro replied, frowning. Don't like that? Yeah. Why should they decide what Megumi does with his life? That decision should be entirely up to Megumi. Doing what one loves is best. Of course, life doesn't always go as desired, but Zoro still wanted Megumi to have the freedom to choose his own path. If he wishes to be a sorcerer, so be it, if he desires something else, then that's fine too. I wish for him to live freely. Toji rested his chin on his hand. It was somewhat incomprehensible that a being born with such blessings could opt out of becoming a sorcerer, but he had no intention of dissuading Zoro. Nor did he feel entitled to. As Megumi's foot peeked out from under the blanket, Zoro gently pulled it up to cover him. Toji chuckled at the familiar overprotectiveness. Blessed, your brother is. You're the one who named him. Megumi. Right. Toji suddenly remembered the time he had spent flipping through dictionaries, comparing various characters to name Megumi. Zenin Toji hardly ever heard his name used during his childhood. Dubbed a disgrace of the Zenin family, there were few who would call him by his given name and surname properly. When he was called, it was often with disdainful labels like you, that thing, or disgrace. His name itself was uncomfortable severe in you. The name chosen by the previous family head clearly reflected what he thought of him. He wanted to give his child a name with a good meaning, something different from his own. After much thought, he chose Megumi. Hoping for a blessed existence and a blessed life. As for Zoro, it was Jie who named him. Toji thought the name Zoro three-fourths I wasn't bad either. Unlike the naming conventions in the sorcery world, where names are given with kanji and imbued with meaning, Zoro's name was simply in katakana, without any particular meaning or hope attached to it, hence free from any curse. If the name Zoro were to acquire any meaning, it would be one derived from the life Zoro lives. That's good, Toji said calmly. You're different from me. Zoro quietly observed Toji's distant green eyes. Sometimes, even though Toji was right there, he seemed as if he might disappear at any moment. Like now. It seemed like Toji was intentionally keeping a distance from them. His reluctance to call Megumi by name, or his tendency to step back instead of approaching when Megumi and Zoro were together, made it clear. As if he felt he didn't belong, he always maintained a boundary, taking a step back. There was a subtle distance, as though he was there but always ready to leave. That's why Zoro still couldn't fully trust Toji. I thought we were getting closer. One moment he's expressing gratitude, and the next, he's distant again. Zoro didn't like this version of Toji. He should make it then. With Toji's birthday approaching, he could make that as a gift. But it wouldn't feel like a birthday present if that was all he gave, so he should include something else. What should it be? After pondering for a while, Zoro stood up and extended his hand. Give me your hand. When Toji extended his hand, Zoro drew a small dagger he was wearing around his neck. With a swift sound, the tips of Toji's white nails were slightly clipped off. Zoro quickly picked up the fallen nail pieces and then disappeared into another room. Toji looked bewilderedly at his slightly shortened nails. The end of year holiday season in Japan is usually bustling. However, that was not applicable to Zoro and Toji. With hardly anyone to write New Year's cards to and well aware that no deity would visit, even if they put up shigatsu decorations, New Year's decorations to welcome the deity of the new year, the holiday season was merely another day off for them to relax together. Still, they did perform the annual year-end cleaning. Toji smiled, recalling when Zoro became a gray marimo from dust while cleaning. Tap tap, Zoro lightly tapped the table with his chopsticks in front of Toji. Aren't you eating? Go ahead. Toji watched Zoro stuffing his face with Tashikashi soba, a bowl of buckwheat noodles traditionally eaten with family on the night of December 31st, until his cheeks bulged, then started eating his own. Megumi had spent the day feasting on New Year's dishes, playing with items found during the cleaning, and had fallen asleep an hour ago, seemingly with more energy with each passing day. It was a good thing, though. After finishing, Toji laid sideways on the sofa and turned on the TV. It was broadcasting the Kahaku Yuta Gassen, a famous annual music show where singers are divided into two teams to perform on New Year's Eve. Zaro came and sat down in front of Toji. Not particularly interested in the TV program, Zaro didn't watch the Kahaku Yuta Gassen, but instead asked Toji. Are we going to eat a sechi, traditional Japanese New Year food served in special boxes, tomorrow? I already bought it. Really? Both Zoro and Toji were not good at cooking. Zoro could handle cutting and preparing ingredients, but not much else. The food wasn't inedible, but it wasn't tasty either. Toji was the same. Unable to even cook regular dishes well, a sechi. Toji wasn't reckless enough to attempt making it from scratch. He simply ordered it from a hotel. This is kind of boring. Toji switched the channel from the Kahaku Yuta Gassen to another. It showed crowds in Tokyo waiting in front of a large screen for the new year. Might as well watch this. Tick, tock, tick, tock. The clock's minute hand moved diligently. 
The new year was drawing near. Noticing there were only 10 minutes left to the new year, Zoro stood in front of Toji, pointing at the TV. Realizing Zoro had something to say, Toji turned down the TV volume. Why? Happy birthday. People gathered, waiting and hoping to celebrate the new year. Yet, Zoro wanted to celebrate Toji's birthday instead. Here's your present. Zoro pulled a small box from within his arms. Toji, who hadn't expected his birthday to be remembered or celebrated, accepted the box in surprise. Upon opening it, he found a knife and a piece of paper inside. The small dagger, always worn as a necklace decoration by Zoro, hidden within a wooden monkey charm, and a white piece of paper with Toji written on it. Though the dagger was recognizable, the purpose of the paper was unclear. Toji lifted the paper, which seemed just like any ordinary piece at first glance. What's this? It's called a Vivre card. A Vivre card? Yeah. What is it? It's a paper made from your nail, showing your life force. Creating a Vivre card was surprisingly simple. The question was whether it could also be made here, but fortunately, it was possible. I'm glad I watched when it was made. Zaro recalled the sworn brother of his captain and Rosa, who had thrown him a bottle. At that time, Sabo had created a Vivre card for Luffy right in front of Zoro's eyes. It was a memory from years ago, somewhat hazy, but he managed to recall how to make it. He nearly had to cut Toji's nail again, due to losing a few pieces in the process. Toji placed a Vivre card he was holding on the table. Then, Zoro tore the Vivre card in half to share it. The pieces of the Vivre card attract each other, no matter where in the world they are. Look. Russell, Russell. Toji's eyes widened as he watched the two pieces of paper move on their own, drawing closer to each other. Zoro kept one piece. If you have one piece and I have the other, no matter where in the world, I can know the direction where you are. Though it doesn't show the distance, it still means something. With this, even if Toji were to run away from home again, Zoro could know the direction to find him, as long as the Vivre card isn't discarded. Of course, even with the Vivre card, Zoro, known for getting lost, might not find his way, but he himself didn't see it that way. Zoro poked the Vivre card with his finger. It also represents your life force. So, if you're in bad shape, it shrinks, and when you recover, it returns to its original size. What if I die? It burns up and disappears completely. Toji picked up one of the torn pieces of the Vivre card. He could feel the faint force in his hand, trying to reach the other torn piece. Then, what about this dagger? Toji already had dozens of better weapons than this. This wasn't exactly a superior weapon. Knowing this, Zoro wouldn't have given it simply for use as a weapon. Moreover, giving this would leave Zoro without a weapon to use. Of course, Toji could give him a jut, but Zoro was still too young to handle such a large weapon properly. Zoro spoke calmly. This is a promise. From now on, no matter what happens, whatever you do. If you give this to me, I'll fight for Toji once. Even if you're no longer with us, no longer care about us, or even if you've betrayed us. Regardless of the reason or situation, without asking anything, I'll stand by your side and fight just once. Strictly speaking, this wasn't a gift. It was a reciprocation. You, too, had turned away from all that pain and void, and had come back once. Realizing all the emotions behind it, Toji looked at Zoro blankly. He struggled to open his mouth, which refused to move. Thinking I would get involved in some fight. Blood stained his hands too deeply to be washed away, and the sins he had accumulated were like a mountain. He wasn't virtuous enough to feel guilty, nor shameless enough to hope for a good end. Nor had he loved his child enough to overlook all that. Yet, Zaro was saying that if Toji wished, he would accompany him even to the hell Toji might fall into. Zaro snorted with a hint of laughter. If you're afraid of that, stay by my side, father. So that I can help you without hesitation, even without something like this. So that I don't need a reason to help you. The countdown to the new year began. People excitedly counting down 10. 9. 8. Could be heard. Toji alternated his gaze between the Vivre card and the dagger. This was Zoro's gesture of goodwill, but also a warning. It was a warning not to push them away with any nonsense, saying he would find Toji once no matter what, telling him not to even dream of letting go now. Once he promises, he never backs down. Even if returned, he wouldn't accept it. Then, the best course was to keep it without using it. 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. Happy New Year. Large letters appeared on the screen, and people cheered. The year 2004 shone brightly. One year had passed. 2003 was gone, and 2004 had arrived. Toji hung the dagger around his neck and put the Vivre card in his trouser pocket. After all, it was a birthday gift from his son, and it didn't feel right to just store it in the armory or with the spirits. Is it hard to make a Vivre card? No. You just need the person's nail. Then make one for your Vivre card and Megumi's too. Why? So I can come find you when you get lost. Ha that wasn't really the reason. 
Since Vivre cards attract each other, having Zoro's Vivre card would allow Toji to know Zoro's location and find him. But the real reason Toji wanted Zoro's Vivre card was so he would know if Zoro was in danger. I can't give one to Megumi. He wouldn't be able to hold onto it. Giving a Vivre card to Megumi could end disastrously if he ended up swallowing it, requiring an immediate trip to the hospital. Losing it would be problematic too. Since Megumi changes clothes daily, sewing it into his clothing was impractical. We'll make it and keep it with us for now, and when Megumi's older, we can tear it and give it to him. Okay. Zoro smiled. Toji shook his head. It was bizarre to give a gift that essentially invited one into danger, and then smile about it. But it was also pitiable. Toji placed his hand on Zoro's head and slowly stroked it. Thank you. I love you. Zoro's eyes widened at Toji's following words, and he grumbled. Late. Me too. The gruff response was touching. Toji extended his arms and embraced his son. It was a warm new year. A taxi stopped in front of a massive abandoned building. The rear door opened, and Iori Yudahim stepped out of the taxi. As soon as she alighted, the taxi hurried away as if it had been waiting just for that. Yudahim stretched her body. The taxi driver hadn't seen it, but her eyes caught it clearly. A black veil hung over the abandoned building. It's been a while since I've been on a mission. Last summer, Yudahim was assigned a misgraded mission. Originally a grade 3 sorcerer, she was tasked with handling two grade 2 spirits alone. Somehow, she managed to exercise them, but she was severely injured in the process, dedicating the busiest summer months entirely to recovery. At least it led to my promotion to sub-grade 2. Perhaps because it was her first mission after a significant injury, the Jujutsu Hai didn't assign her a spirit extermination mission, but something different. A task not requiring combat, yet not so simple that it could be handed to a complete novice. You've arrived, Miziori. An assistant director who had been waiting approached and greeted Yudahim respectfully. She returned the greeting. Let's go in. Yes. The assistant director pulled back the veil. Upon lifting the veil, Yudahim halted at the sight of the enormous spirit. Like the water used to rinse a brush after painting, various colors were chaotically mixed within the spirit lying there. Its abdomen was split in half as if cut by something sharp, and blood was everywhere. The spirit, not yet dead, writhed and made a sound. Now, now, everyone. The button, the button the assistant director left Yudahim inside and dropped the veil again. I assume you've read the briefing documents on your way here. Yes, though I must admit, some parts were unclear to me. This mission wasn't about exercising a spirit. Nor was it about dealing with a curse user. More precisely, it was a mission to investigate the cause behind a spirit's affliction. Understandably so. Let me explain in detail once more. The assistant director pulled out the documents. At approximately 11.43 am today, an off-duty assistant director, while relaxing near his home, heard cries for help coming from within an abandoned building, and discovered a dying spirit. Was that you? Yes. Yudahim internally expressed sympathy for the assistant director, who had essentially wasted his scarce vacation. The assistant director assumed a sorcerer who was assigned an exorcism mission, had forgotten to put up a barrier, so he immediately erected one and checked inside the building, but found no one. There were no residual traces either. Feeling something was off, he immediately contacted Tokyo Jujutsu Hai, and you, Miziori, were dispatched. Listening attentively, Yudahim inquired. Could it be that the headquarters sent someone on an exorcism mission, or maybe another sorcerer was passing by and performed the exorcism? Or perhaps there's a sorcerer not yet identified by the headquarters. Young sorcerers, especially those born to non-sorcerer parents, often use sorcery instinctively without knowing they are sorcerers. They exercise spirits without even knowing what they are, leading to lower rates of spirit occurrences around where such sorcerers live. That's why Jujutsu High monitors areas where the number of spirits seems unusually low compared to the population. The Bunkyo district in Tokyo, where this incident occurred, is one such area. Sorcerers from non-sorcerer families are often scouted into Jujutsu High through such processes. Since Yudahim's colleague was also discovered this way, she wondered if this case was similar. The assistant director immediately shook his head. No. The headquarters nor Jujutsu High sent anyone for an exorcism mission here, and there were no other sorcerers nearby. Moreover, if a sorcerer had performed an exorcism, there would definitely be residual traces left behind, but none were found. The nearby CCTV cameras also didn't capture anything of note. Yudahim enhanced her vision with her sorcery to scrutinize the area around the spirit. Indeed, no residual traces were found. She meticulously checked other areas too, but the situation was the same. Yudahim reverted her vision to normal and asked. You mentioned hearing cries for help earlier. Was a non-sorcerer inside the building and attacked by the spirit? Despite being an abandoned building, it was broad daylight in Tokyo. It wouldn't have been strange for a few non-sorcerers to pass by. There was one person inside. They're safe. 
We kept them here considering the possibility that they might be a sorcerer. Bring them to me, please. Yes. Yudahem sent the assistant director away and continued to circle around the spirit, searching for traces. She hummed thoughtfully. What grade might this spirit have been? Given the spirit was nearly dead, there was no way to determine its grade. A mere touch could kill it now. Only very famous spirits recorded in history or those in human form could be identified but those are usually special grade. This one wasn't that. Probably. Yudahem placed her hands on her hips, pondering. Nothing? There was absolutely no clue to be found. Not only were there no residual traces left by cursed energy or techniques, but there were also no talismans, footprints, or anything resembling a weapon. Could it be that a spirit furred another spirit? Yudham thought for a moment then shook her head. Spirits only manifest malice towards humans. Unless controlled by a human, spirits do not fight each other. To inflict such a wound, it would require a very long and sharp weapon. Yudham looked at the deep cut bisecting the spirit's swollen belly. Miziori. She turned around. The assistant director had returned, his face seemingly aged in the short interval. Though Yudahem had requested the person found inside the building to be brought to her, she was puzzled when the assistant director returned alone, only for a small girl to suddenly appear behind him. Hello, big sister. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yudahem observed the cheerfully greeting child. Despite the giant spirit behind Yudahem, the girl seemed completely unaware, focusing only on Yudahem. A non-sorcerer, then. And one who couldn't even see spirits. A child who seemed about six years old, a non-sorcerer oblivious to spirits. The likelihood of getting any useful clues from her was nearly zero. Nevertheless, Yudahem crouched down in front of the girl. My name is Iori Yudahem. I'm Mai. Sato Mai. Alright, Mai. Can you tell me what happened here? Sure. What happened to Mai today was Mai began her tale. She had left home after a disliked breakfast of curry, despite her mother's warning. She hated curry, especially with carrots and broccoli in it, but had eaten it all to be allowed yogurt her mother's condition. Protesting the unfairness, she had stormed out to play at the nearby playground, where she encountered Haruto, a boy who deliberately ruined her sandcastle. Claiming it was ugly, Mai retaliated by throwing sand in his eyes. She fled when he tried to do the same, boasting about her speed and recalling a recent victory in a race at a sports festival. Despite not beating the older kids, her father had praised her and lifted her high, making her wish to grow as tall as him. However, despite following her father's advice to listen to her mother, her height hadn't increased, leading her to fib about finding her father more handsome than a TV star to match his light. Big sister, are you listening? Yes. In truth, Yudahem had lost track halfway through. Something about a sandcastle? With missing teeth in her grin, Mai laughed brightly. That's great. No one usually listens to me. Even mom and dad. I spoke slowly for them, but they keep changing the subject. That's not right. I learned in school what was it? Kaichu? Kachaku? Ah, active listening. Yes. That's important. But the teacher said it's important for me too. I listen well. It's just Haruto who doesn't. Even when told not to, he breaks my sandcastle. My sandcastle is so pretty. It has a castle for a prince, a princess, and even a place for a dog. Yudham hastily interjected as my story seemed to never end. Uh, Mai? I want to know what you saw here. I was getting to that. I was running from Haruto when suddenly the house changed. It was supposed to be Satsuno Grandma's house there. Her house has a red roof and a persimmon tree in the yard. I even climbed it once. Mom got so scared she never let me again. Anyway, it wasn't there, and everything was too dark and damp, and it smelled bad, so I was really scared. What do I do? How do I handle this? Then I remembered. The teacher taught us a song for when we get lost. Stop, think to please help M.E.K. my name, phone number, parents name is always Remembergy so, I stood still and kept thinking of my name, phone number, and parents names, while shouting please help, please help. Then this man appeared like magic listening to Mai's continuous chatter, Yudahem smiled gently and stood up. It seemed getting useful information from this child was a lost cause. Listening to her for about 20 hours might eventually yield the information Yudahem wanted, but sorcerers weren't afforded such leisure. With the spirit nearly dead and no reason to detain a non-sorcerer child who couldn't even see spirits, Yudahem stood up from her crouched position. Are you hurt anywhere? Nope. Mai is healthy. I even ate carrots and broccoli. Oh, speaking of broccoli, that reminds me of something similar to, glad to hear it. Assistant director, please take her home. Yes. Miziori. Behind you. Yudahem turned to look at the spirit behind her. Silently. The spirit seemed to have finally passed away, its form disappearing. The blood that had soaked the interior of the building, faded as if water drying on a towel, eventually vanishing completely. It was over. With the spirit gone, there were no further avenues for investigation.
Yudaham suppressed a sigh as she pondered how to draft her report. Please take her home. And if she says anything, let me know. I've already heard plenty yes. That must have been why the assistant director seemed aged in the brief time he had the child with him. Yudaham looked at him with pity, now seemingly aged into his fifties. At least, since the child was young, there was no need to silence her. At that age, children often spout nonsensical things, so parents likely wouldn't take it seriously. And. That child seemed to be quite the chatterbox herself. As the veil was lifted and the assistant director left with the child, Yudaham turned away from where the spirit had vanished. Thud. Something caught Yudaham's foot. Looking down, she saw a glass bottle. The bottle was broken, leaving sharp edges of glass. Yudaham, as if entranced, wrapped her hand in her clothing and grasped the neck of the bottle like a handle. With the jagged, broken edges pointing forward, it resembled a weapon. Could it be? This as a weapon? What am I thinking? After pondering for a moment, Yudaham shook her head. Of course, such a thing couldn't possibly serve as a weapon. While the broken edges were somewhat sharp, that was all there was to it. It wasn't capable of tearing through a spirit's flesh. More likely, it would have broken upon use. Simply applying physical force wouldn't suffice to capture a spirit, it would need to be reinforced with cursed energy, and that would have left residual traces. Besides, the bottle is too small. If it was too small even for Yudaham, who had small hands, then only a child like the one she had seen earlier could possibly wield it as a weapon. Losing interest, Yudaham flung the bottle away. It shattered with a crisp sound upon hitting the floor. She then fretted over how to report this. Ah, what to do? Her first mission back ending so anticlimactically. Who could have done this? Iori Yudaham shouted in frustration, unaware that a man had been watching her before disappearing, unnoticed by anyone. What's this, someone's talking about me. Zaro scratched his ear, then quickly lost interest. Whether someone was talking about him or not, what did it matter? Yawning, Zaro sat down. Come to think of it, I've been having these strange dreams lately. It was a dream where everything was pitch black, with only a white path visible. And it wasn't just once or twice that he had this dream. Lately, it seemed to occur a bit more frequently, though he would have it periodically every few weeks. When did I first have that dream? Zaro could easily recall that moment. It was the first night after he had been reincarnated. Originally, there were no sounds in that dream. But recently, there had been sounds. The sounds of metal scraping against metal, like something caught in a machine. Creak, creak. Well, a dream is just a dream. Zaro stopped his thoughts there. It's about time to go. Click. Toji opened the door and entered the training ground. Zaro stood up from where he had been sitting, brushing himself off. You're here. What did you go do? I went to check the place where you fought with Jure today. Zaro had gone to the training ground with Toji today, but got separated from Toji for a moment, not intentionally, he just lost his way and fought with Jure in an abandoned building. Toji had belatedly discovered Zoro and hurriedly brought him to the training ground, then returned alone to the abandoned building to erase the traces. However, during that brief moment, someone who saw Jure, who had not quite died yet, found him and contacted the sorcery authorities. Why there? Because a sorcerer came to investigate. Toji scratched the scar on his lip as he recalled the young female sorcerer, who had been roaring about who was responsible for the act. She was probably affiliated with the Tokyo Sorcery College. I figured we'd get caught eventually. It was too soon, though. Settling in one place and continuously capturing the local Jure made it an inevitable outcome. Zoro asked, did those guys figure out it was me? No way. Unlike physical strength, hockey leaves no trace like residual energy. Weapons imbued with hockey return to their original state the moment the hockey is withdrawn. Moreover, today Zoro didn't even use a proper weapon, but a broken glass bottle he found nearby. The jure that could have been a clue died quickly. Thanks to Toji's repeated instructions and teachings, Zoro was able to leave the scene without leaving fingerprints, footprints, or getting caught on CCTV. Consequently, the sorcerer had to search a scene without any residues or traces. Besides, who would think a four-year-old did that? In ten days, I'll be five. Yeah, a kid turning five in ten days. Today is November 1st, 2004. Almost a year since Toji returned, Zaro had grown quite a bit. He had grown taller, and his movements were much more agile than a year ago. However, to Toji, he still seemed like a little kid. Zaro shrugged his shoulders. If they don't know it was me, there's no problem. It's not that simple, son. Although they weren't caught today, it's uncertain what might happen next. The sorcery headquarters might be incompetent, but if the jure in this area continue to disappear, they will surely start to suspect. Can't we just ignore it? Was there a kid nearby? Is he okay? Thanks to who? Hmm, that's good. Next time can't we just ignore it? Toji swallowed those words. It's not that he doesn't know what is right, he just chooses not to live by it. 
Toji knew that Zoro was much more upright than himself. Next time, what? Never mind. He wouldn't listen anyway. If there was trouble, Toji would just have to deal with it. What worried him was that someday the scale of the trouble might become too large for Toji to cover up. If Zoro's identity is revealed, it would surely upheaval the sorcery world. A non-sorcerer, not just any sorcerer or someone with zero cursed energy, but a mere non-sorcerer catching a second grade yurei at the mere age of 4 or 5. And not with physical strength, but with an unheard of technique called hockey. All sorts of riffraff would come swarming. Whether they refuse to believe and deny it, attempt to kill out of fear, refuse to believe he is a non-sorcerer, and suspect there must be something else, try to coax him into joining their family, or attempt to marry him off to their children especially since Zoro is a Zenin. Zenin. The surname that Toji had tried to abandon all his life but ultimately couldn't, ending up passing it on to his children. As long as he carries the Zenin surname, the sorcery world will show immense interest in Zoro. Especially the Zenin family. Even if Naobito doesn't mind, those damned old fools who pride themselves as elders won't accept Zoro. Surprisingly, the current head, Naobito, didn't care much about lineage or whether someone was a direct descendant or not, as long as they had the ability and quality to exercise Jurei and cursed spirits. However, the elders of the Zenin family were different. They strictly valued sorcerers who were direct descendants of the head and possessed the Ten Shadows technique above all. They were obsessed with the Ten Shadows technique, secretly fathering numerous children with various women to ensure their sons or grandsons inherited it. Boys and girls who didn't manifest the technique were discarded, and only those with the technique were admitted into the Zenin family. They went to great lengths, including divorcing their wives and remarrying the mothers of their illegitimate children, who manifested the Ten Shadows technique. Even cousin marriages were common to ensure their children possessed the Ten Shadows technique, to the extent that even the previous head married a cousin for this reason. Ironically. The result was Toji, a Zenin with zero cursed energy. Megumi might be an exception, but the elders wouldn't look kindly on Zoro. Zoro, unlike Toji, might have cursed energy, but after all, he is a non-sorcerer. Moreover, he can't even see cursed spirits, and they consider him a disgrace as Toji's son. What to do should I change his surname? When marrying Chie, Toji had intended to become a son-in-law and change his surname to Tanaka, but Chie, having a poor relationship with her parents and not liking her surname either, decided against it. It wouldn't be impossible to find an Asigoing woman to marry and become a son-in-law now Zoro wouldn't like it. It's a last resort, but not an option for now. Then, what about eradicating the Zenin family completely? To kill them off for good this time, thoroughly crushing them to ensure they can't interfere with Zoro and Megumi's future. To leave no trace of them in his life hey. Zoro tapped Toji with a bamboo sword, snapping him out of his thoughts. Stop thinking. Let's finish what we were doing. Zoro, holding two bamboo swords, wrapped them with a layer of energy. The hockey gently radiating around the sticks resembled falling cherry blossom petals. Today, we'll practice awakening both types of hockey energy. Don't use weapons, just dodge your block with your body. When dodging, focus on sensing my presence, when blocking, imagine you're wearing invisible armor. Toji set aside all thoughts, captivated by Zoro's intense gaze and the deep, black hockey of his energy. He had to focus on defending against his son's and stern instructor's attack first. Clang. Clang. Toji's body clashed with Zoro's two bamboo swords. Blocking, dodging, and clashing again. There was no intent to kill between them, but even without it, their duel was sharp. When Toji pushed one of the bamboo swords away with his hand, the other, seizing the opportunity, lunged in eagerly. He tried to kick it away, but the force of the hockey instead repelled him. In that moment, the other bamboo sword he had pushed away charged towards Toji's head. Using two weapons doesn't necessarily make one stronger than when using just one. It's about how organically and efficiently one can use those two weapons that gives meaning to wielding them. Zaro was, of course, capable of this. Snap. Toji raised his arm to block the bamboo sword targeting his head, and, ignoring the numb pain spreading through his arm, moved his body. Standing still because of pain would only invite another strike. Whoosh. Toji dodged a bamboo sword that grazed the tip of his nose. By focusing on sensing presence over relying on his senses and physical abilities, his speed seemed to slow down. Hockey is a fearsome technique. Even a cheap bamboo sword, like those commonly seen in local kendo dojos, could deliver a blow as powerful as a top-grade weapon. Thinking it's okay to get hit because it's just a bamboo practice sword would lead to experiencing hell from the sensation of the struck area, feeling sliced in half and twisted for the entire day. That's what happened when Toji accidentally tore Zoro's bandana and blew away half of his green hair during a sparring session. The bamboo sword sliced through the air. Zoro frowned. There was nothing caught on the blade's edge. I'm using observation hockey to predict movements, but it's still too fast. 
What good is knowing where he'll dodge to if by the time I realize it, he's already moved somewhere else. Even though they were restricting the use of physical abilities to focus on hockey training, it was still too fast, not even at full sprint. If I went all out, even my past self would have trouble catching up due to the speed. Still, it doesn't mean there's no way to win. Zaro gripped his bamboo swords tightly. The already blackened swords overflowed with a more concentrated hockey, surging with a pitch black energy. I can't match my father's speed. Then, the only option left was to overpower him with force. Two sword style. Flash. Zoro's two bamboo swords swung horizontally. Toji hurriedly blocked, but the slash produced from the swords was too immense. Creak, creak. The black crescent-shaped slash gradually pushed Toji back until the ground beneath him caved in, and he was propelled straight into the wall of the training ground. Boom. Dust billowed up. Toji, sitting against a wall, brushed off the dust and debris from his hair. Son, are you trying to kill me? Don't exaggerate. You didn't even take any real damage. Zaro clicked his tongue. It was an attack he had gathered all his armament hockey for, yet it caused no harm. The hockey receded, and the bamboo swords returned to their original color. Toji raised an eyebrow, and Zoro said, that's it for today. Already? Look at the time. Toji checked the phone he had set aside. It was 6.15pm. They needed to head back now to have dinner with Megumi. Are you in a hurry? A bit. Observation hockey, armament hockey. Nearly a year had passed since Toji began his hockey training, yet he had not mastered either type. It wasn't for lack of effort. Both the teacher, Zaro, and the student, Toji, worked hard. Zaro consistently built up his stamina, training with Toji twice a week in the spring, and increasing it to three times a week by summer. Toji's skills had improved significantly. Until now, he had never faced someone who wasn't a jure or a sorcerer, who could completely understand his presence, or who was better with a weapon than him. Zaro met all three criteria. Although a non-sorcerer, Zaro comprehended Toji's movements with observation hockey, albeit not being able to follow them, and his understanding of the sword far surpassed Toji's. Despite his young body not fully realizing that enlightenment, the fact that he could somewhat contend with Toji showed the level of Zoro's swordsmanship. Or perhaps, it showed that Toji couldn't measure it. Toji looked down at his palm. Fighting an opponent he had never faced before made Toji grow. The battles weren't genuinely life-threatening, Toji thought it better to commit suicide by stabbing himself in the head with a weapon, if it were to come to that, but simply facing Zoro as an enemy taught Toji much and made him stronger over the past year. Yet, he still hadn't acquired hockey. Monkey's offspring. As a voice filled with contempt rang in his ears, Toji clenched his fist and closed his eyes. The person who had said those words was already dead. There was no way the son before him would say such a thing. Step, step. Zaro walked towards the sitting Toji, placed his bamboo sword aside, and plopped down in front of him. You know, why do you want to obtain hockey? It was a question that came out of nowhere and perhaps a bit late, considering it had been almost a year since the training started. Though somewhat puzzled, Toji nonetheless answered his son's question. Because it can make me stronger. You've already become stronger. It's different. If I had hockey if he had it Toji was unable to complete his sentence. Zaro tilted his head. If you had it? What would change? What do you want to do? What are you dreaming of? Toji did not answer. He couldn't. He didn't know the answer himself. Zaro snorted. Listen well, father. A dream that one cannot proudly speak of does not harbor willpower. No matter how absurd, no matter how distant, even if no one knows whether it truly exists. Even if everyone laughs, at least the person with the dream should believe in it and move forward. Because a dream doubted by its dreamer cannot hold firm resolve. Do you have such a dream? Yes. What is it? The strongest. To be the strongest swordsman was a goal achieved in a past life, and this time, he intended to ascend to the position of the strongest among all. Toji chuckled lightly. That's lofty. It is. Being the strongest as a swordsman and being the strongest among all are different challenges. Even knowing this, Zoro harbored such ambition. Because it was his dream. While being the strongest was Zoro's goal, Toji didn't need to aim for the same. Anything was fine. What mattered was whether or not he could pursue that goal without doubt and with all his effort. I won't rein you until you can clearly articulate that for yourself. What? The reason you haven't learned hockey isn't due to a lack of theory or experience. It's your heart. That's something others can't teach. No amount of physical training will help. It's entirely dependent on one's own will and desires. Think about it. What you want, what you want to become. Toji sat blankly in front of the sofa after dinner at home, Zaro's words echoing in his mind. What do I want to do after obtaining hockey? He couldn't grasp it. There was a vague desire to become stronger. But if that was all, he shouldn't be so impatient about not having mastered hockey yet. He wasn't weak now, after all. 
Do I want to obtain Haki to protect Zoro and Megumi? That wasn't entirely untrue. He did feel that way. However, there was also a faint different desire. A longing that even Toji couldn't articulate clearly. Papa. Megumi offered Toji a yogurt. Toji opened the lid for him. This wasn't for Toji to eat. It was a request for him to open it. Toji had learned this lesson after he absentmindedly ate it himself once, resulting in Megumi bursting into tears. Megumi happily sucked on the yogurt. After a burp, he handed the empty yogurt container back to Toji. More. No. Why? Ask your brother. Megumi turned and whined towards Zoro. Brother. Eating too much sweet stuff will rot your teeth. Then you'll have to go to the hospital. Zoro said, placing the dish brush in the sink. Megumi frowned deeply. I don't want to. If you don't want to go to the hospital, then don't eat it. I don't want to. It'll rot your teeth. I don't want to Zoro didn't even glance over. Toji watched the scene with a small smile. Zoro cared deeply for Megumi, but he wasn't overly indulgent. When it came to saying no, he was quite firm. Deflated, Megumi snuggled into Toji's embrace. Toji shifted to make space for him. As Megumi's hair grew longer, it sprawled out more, turning him almost hedgehog-like. Zoro came into the living room and glanced at Toji. Their eyes met, but Zoro shrugged, indicating he had no intention of helping Toji with his dilemma, and focused solely on Megumi. Toji sighed. He thought perhaps getting beaten up by his eldest son, as before, might have been preferable. Since he wasn't coming to an answer about hockey, Toji decided to think about something else. By the way, your birthday is on the 11th of this month. Yeah, it is. Is there anything you want? Last year, Toji hadn't been able to celebrate Zoro's birthday because it coincided with the day he returned home. There was too much to do, and by the time he was settled, it was too late to arrange anything. This year, Toji wanted to give Zoro something he truly desired. A sword. Preferably, a katana. A sword it was needed. For his last birthday, Toji had given Zoro his monkey-shaped dagger necklace, leaving Zoro currently without a weapon. Although Toji rarely left Zoro alone, and Zoro tended to use whatever was at hand as a makeshift weapon, not really needing one. Toji did have swords among his weapons collection. However, for some reason, they didn't seem to fit Zoro well. They might be used temporarily, but as for something specifically for Zoro moreover, most of the swords Toji owned were cursed weapons. Using them in combat could leave traces of cursed energy at the scene. Given Toji's caution about Zoro being discovered by the sorcery authorities, cursed weapons weren't ideal. I'll have to see Xiu Kong. Toji thought calmly. Zoro raised three fingers. Three swords. No. TCH. You haven't even got all your permanent teeth yet. And he's talking about holding a sword in his mouth, as if that wouldn't risk losing them all. One of my front teeth is wobbly. A new one will come in soon. Well, that's why it's a no. Zoro made a displeased face. Megumi watched Zoro for a moment before he, too, clicked his tongue. TCH. It was clear to anyone he was imitating Zoro. Zoro's face froze in surprise, and Toji's body shook as he tried not to laugh. Kaha, don't laugh. Why? It's funny. TCH. TCH. Megumi, stop clicking your tongue. Love you. TCH. Love you too, hey Megumi. A few days later, Toji called Xiu Kong. So, you're looking for a quality katana? Xiu Kong's skeptical voice came through the phone. Toji replied, one that's not a cursed tool. Picky, aren't you? Finding a good katana was easier if it was a cursed tool. The reason was simple. Aside from sorcerers, hardly anyone uses katanas as weapons nowadays, except maybe the Yakuza. There were antiques, but those were expensive and often lacked in performance as weapons, made from inferior steel from times when metallurgy wasn't as advanced. Naturally, there weren't many people specializing in making katanas. There were cheap ones available, but finding something that would satisfy a sorcerer killer was extremely difficult. How about taking on a job? Kill and take. There's a job to handle a cursed tool user in Okinawa. I'm not doing it. Toji flatly refused. Hmm, not even going to hear out the pay? It's too far. Getting a birthday present meant he'd have to be away from Zoro for a long time to acquire it, and Zoro wouldn't be too pleased with any gift if that were the case. It'd be meaningless. Plus, if it's a cursed tool user, they would likely possess cursed tools. He wondered if he had started too late in preparing for the gift, with the birthday less than five days away. Would he have to resort to giving one of his own swords? Toji scratched his head in frustration. Oh, now that I think about it. What? I heard about some guy who smuggled out a really good katana from Time Vessel Association and went AWOL. He's looking for a buyer. Time Vessel Association? Anyone involved in the sorcery world would recognize that name. It was the residence of Tenjin, the immortal sorcerer who had protected the country for centuries. Toji smiled wryly. Even Time Vessel Association has defectors? 
I thought it was full of zealots ready to lay down their lives for Tenjin. Well, it shows it's a place where people live, after all. And where people live, betrayal is inevitable. Understanding Xu Kong's implication, Toji asked, are you sure it's not a curse tool? Definitely. Many laughed, saying who would pay that much for a non-curse tool sword. How much are they asking? 500 million yen. Toji frowned. That price was comparable to a top-grade curse tool. Of course, such curse tools are rarely sold, so the asking price is generally inflated. But if it truly was a non-curse tool yet a quality katana, there couldn't be a more useful item for Zoro right now. As Toji fell silent, Xiu Kong asked in a surprised tone, what, you're really considering buying it? Or planning to kill and take? Thinking about it. I wouldn't recommend it, Zenin. After all, its quality is just what that guy claims, and there's no way to know if such a sword really exists. Plus, if it's real, it was something stored in Time Vessel Association. It could potentially provoke not just Time Vessel Association, but the entire sorcery community. Toji was well aware of the risk Xiu Kong mentioned. However, something felt oddly compelling. It seemed like what, because he had a son who would chase him to the ends of hell if he did. Toji hung up the phone, hoping things would go smoothly. The evening before Zoro's birthday, Xiu Kong reported in more detail about the Time Vessel Association deserter and the sword he was selling. Yes, he was affiliated with Time Vessel Association and has defected. Time Vessel Association has been quite persistent in tracking him. But there's hardly any information about the sword itself. It's not non-existent, but everything comes from what the guy has said, so its reliability is questionable. The sword was a katana, not a cursed tool, with good performance, and priced at 500 million yen. That was all that was known about it. Without seeing the item in person, it was impossible to discern truth from fabrication. Thus, after much deliberation, Toji decided to meet the man. Alone. You're going by yourself? Zaro didn't know exactly what Toji was going to buy, only that it was a transaction with a sorcerer, not regular shopping. Why? Frowning, Zaro asked curtly, clearly not pleased. Toji carefully responded, it's too dangerous to take you with me. Dealing with sorcerers often involved risks. There could be ambushes by sorcerers disguised as sellers, price gouging at the meeting point, bait and switch tactics, or even attempts to kill and rob. The seller may have been part of Time Vessel Association, but in the end, he was a defected sorcerer. Sorcerers could harm anyone, children or non-sorcerers alike, if it served their purpose. Though the chances were low, if the seller turned out to be a first-class sorcerer or higher, taking Zoro along would be dangerous. Expecting Zoro to explode in anger, questioning if he was being underestimated, Zoro instead sighed deeply and surprisingly complied. Okay. Zoro enjoyed combat, but also understood there were times when it was necessary to avoid it. Currently, Zoro couldn't use flying slashes or conqueror's hockey. Involving him in Toji's battle would likely be more of a hindrance. Now was not the time to leap into battle, but to stop and build strength. Accepting that fact didn't mean he liked it, though. Zoro clenched his fist and said, I'll get stronger faster. You don't have to. To Toji's knowledge, Zoro was already as strong as a second-class sorcerer or beyond. Being so powerful at not even five years old was beyond genius by any standard. Whether a distant relative or an illegitimate child, he would be immediately considered a candidate for the next head. Even Toji found it difficult to claim he knew all of Zoro's strengths. There were likely several trump cards that Zoro kept to himself, not even revealed to Toji. And amidst all this, Zaro was talking about getting stronger faster. Make sure you're not late coming back. Toji felt a shiver down his spine. To him, Zaro's words sounded like a warning that he'd come looking if Toji didn't return soon. The thought of Zoro wandering alone in Tokyo at night, potentially becoming lost, made Toji's head spin. I must return as quickly as possible. Otherwise, he'd spend the entire day searching Tokyo with a Vivre card in hand to find Zoro. Months ago, Toji attempted to teach Zoro how to navigate, only to realize the futility when Zoro walked in the exact opposite direction on a straight path. It was then Toji understood teaching Zoro to navigate was impossible. And it became clear that Zoro definitely lacked a sense of direction, undoubtedly a wandering soul. Toji ruffled Zoro's mossy tuft of hair. I'll be back quickly. Take good care of Megumi. Okay. Leaving the house, Toji ran with all his might for the first time in a long while. For the past year, he hadn't been working, and when walking or training with Zoro, he always matched Zoro's pace, so there was no need to run this fast. Silently leaping over rooftops, Toji tilted his head. Something feels different. But not in a bad way. On the contrary, it felt better. Originally, Toji's physical abilities and senses were so sharp that he could perceive and see all sorts of things while running at high speed. Now, it seemed his range had expanded, and his senses had become more refined. Maybe it's because of the observation hockey training. 
Zaro had told Toji that he had already become stronger, and it seemed he wasn't wrong. Toji just hadn't had the opportunity to really feel it. Upon reaching the destination, Toji saw Xiu Kong in his car. Toji leaped down from the rooftop to in front of Xiu Kong. Watching Toji land lightly, Xiu Kong exhaled a puff of smoke from his cigarette. You're here. Yeah. The location? They said they'd contact me with the details. As Toji frowned, Xiu Kong remarked, told you we shouldn't go through with this deal. Xiu Kong dropped his spent cigarette to the ground and stamped it out. It's the first time you've shown such interest in a weapon that's not a curse tool. It was for Zoro's birthday present, after all. Toji left those words unsaid. The money? And my cursed spirit. Surprising. You're really planning to buy it? I thought for sure you'd just take it by force. Maybe. In the past, Toji would have definitely taken the sword by force. There were very few who could win against him in a fight, and if it was just about stealing the sword and running away, he was confident he could manage it even against someone as strong as Goho Satoru. However, for a birthday gift for Zoro, he didn't want to stain it with blood or leave behind any grudges. Xiu Kong stared at Toji intently and then spoke. You've changed. Have I? I didn't think you'd change again after that time. Toji tensed up, recognizing what that time referred to. Realizing his slip, Xiu Kong quickly checked his phone and changed the subject. They've sent a location. Want to go in my car, or will you go alone? I'll go alone. Though the plan was originally for both to go, Xiu Kong didn't press further. He might not receive a broker's fee and end up offering a free service, but stirring up trouble with a sorcerer killer wasn't worth worrying about such matters. Xiu Kong sent the meeting place to Toji's phone and quickly left in his car. Toji checked the address on his phone and pinpointed the location using his mental map of Tokyo. He hadn't expected the Tokyo map he memorized in case Zoro got lost to come in handy like this. Toji vanished from the spot in an instant. The meeting place was an already closed theater. Toji watched an old sign that read private property, no trespassing from a distance before spitting out the spirit bead he had been carrying in his stomach. Regardless of his willingness to negotiate, he had no intention of letting his guard down. Wrapping the inflated spirit bead around his body, Toji quietly entered the theater without anyone noticing. The ticket booth was blocked by wooden planks instead of glass, and chairs were torn out and scattered around. The lighting was dim, but to Toji, this level of darkness was no different from broad daylight. And then, Toji smelled something he couldn't ignore. Blood. Toji's eyes sharpened. He took out a special grade sword, Yun, Jo, from the spirit bead, and surveyed the surroundings. The strong smell of blood came from two places, but he could only hear one heartbeat. The implication was clear. One dead, one not yet dead. Toji tensed his body, ready for combat, and headed towards the source of the heartbeat. Soon, he realized there was no need for that. Hey, you've arrived. Sorcerer killer. An old man with white hair tied back was sitting in front of the screen. Blood was dripping from the old man's mouth, and his left arm had been completely severed, rolling on the ground. Intuitively, Toji recognized the old man in front of him as the person he was supposed to deal with. I came to make a deal. I called you here, cough. Didn't you know? Toji glanced at the man's corpse left in a corner. It was so brutally mutilated that, if not for a keen eye, one couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. The old man chuckled as he noticed where Toji was looking. It's the guy who took my arm, cough, I wanted to finish him off properly. But with my body like this, ha, huh, I couldn't do it properly. Mad old man. Sorcerers, kek. Are they all the same? Toji narrowed his eyes as he spotted a headband on the floor. It was soaked in blood, but the emblem embroidered on the headband was clearly from Time Vessel Association. It seemed the rumor of him being pursued by Time Vessel Association was true. The old man said. It belongs to the dead. I've abandoned that emblem. Indeed. It would be absurd to carry the emblem of Time Vessel Association after deserting. Heh, well. Truth is, I feel like I haven't quite let go of that emblem. Kek, Kek. Born into a family of little renown, he devoted his life to Tenjin. After being scorned as a bastard, unable to inherit the family's sorcery, and expelled, he struggled to enter Time Vessel Association. Working for Tenjin, considered a sage and historian of the sorcery world, he believed he would prove himself valuable. He believed he would be recognized. Yet, this is where he ended up. How can you expect others to recognize you if you don't recognize yourself? Recalling an unforgettable voice, the old man laughed half madly. Ha, ha, ha. You were right. How could they recognize me when I don't even recognize myself? Heh, kaluk, I wonder how much they'll mock me in the afterlife. Toji looked down at the old man contemplatively. Negotiating was futile. Though the man was barely clinging to life, his death wouldn't be surprising. Toji could have pressed for the location of the sword or simply walked away, any last words? Impulsively, Toji asked. He didn't know why. He just felt like it. 
The old man, not expecting such a question, looked up at Toji blankly. In the men's restroom floor, call luck, there lies the item we agreed to trade. It's sealed with a spell that only I or Lord Tenjin can open but, if you can take it, it's yours. The old man pulled out a blood-soaked paper from his bosom. It had a bank name and account number written on it. Send the money to this account. Even though you're about to die? It's not my account. Call luck, it belongs to someone who claims to be my daughter. I'm your daughter. He had always thought that she wasn't his daughter. Yet, ironically, she was the only one he thought of in the end. Now, it doesn't matter what happens. Whether she was his real daughter or not. Whether the sorcerer killer actually sends the money to her or not. The old man saw Toji pick up the paper and snickered. What a sight to behold at the end of his life. That sorcerer killer even considering a dying man's request. The old man's eyelids fluttered before slowly covering his pupils. His breathing stopped, followed by his heart. Toji watched as the old man's breath and heartbeat slowed down, and then quietly ceased. Despite having witnessed death more than once, he felt an odd sensation this time. Turning around, he headed to the men's restroom. The entrance was cluttered with wooden planks, making it difficult to enter. Bang! Toji stomped his foot on the floor forcefully, causing tiles to burst upwards, and the ground to cave in. Beneath the floor, a securely locked long box was revealed. A single word was engraved on the surface of the box. Canon Superscript 3 -0. Avalokitesvara? Was this the name of the sword? Naming a sword after a Buddha seemed off. Toji frowned thoughtfully. He tried to open the box with force, but as the old man said, it was sealed with a spell, and not even Toji's strength could budge it. Toji then filled the mouth of the jure with Yun, and took out the Amano Sakahoko, inverted spear of heaven. The function of the Amano Sakahoko was to dispel active spells. No matter how advanced a spell, it posed no problem with the Amano Sakahoko at hand. Toji wedged the blade of the Amano Sakahoko into the crack of the box. The spear easily pierced through the spell surrounding the box and flung it open. The moment he saw the sword, Toji knew the old man's words were not bluster. The sword before him was pure white. Like a layer of undisturbed snow in a deserted place, both the scabbard and the handle were immaculately white. Although the blade was still sheathed, the straightness and sharpness characteristic of a famed sword were unmistakable. Carefully, he lifted the sword. The moment he gripped the handle, a cool sensation swept through his body, causing Toji to tense involuntarily. Slowly, Toji drew the sword from its scabbard. Chak. Ah. A sigh escaped Toji's lips. The jet black blade, in stark contrast to the white handle and scabbard, was exceedingly sharp. It wasn't ornate, but it was a good, solid, and stable sword. Examining the dark blade, Toji's expression turned subtle. Over the past few years, he had seen this pitch black color quite often. It was the exact same color as the armament hockey known by Zoro. Given its distinct characteristics and having observed it for several years, Toji could not be unaware of it. When Zoro imbues his weapon with armament hockey, it turns black. The same color as this sword's blade. Toji glanced at the blade for a moment, then with a click, sheathed the sword again. Whatever it was, this was not the time to ponder. The traitor had been killed by the Sorcerer of Time Vessel Association, and there was no telling when another pursuer might come. He needed to leave this place as soon as possible. Toji sheathed the sword and closed the box. Then, carrying the box, he disappeared from the spot like the wind. Toji checked for pursuers and only went home after confirming it was safe. By the time he arrived at his house, it was almost midnight. He opened the door, carrying the box with the sword on his side. Zaro was leaning against the wall, snoring softly in his sleep. As Toji stepped in, Zaro immediately woke up and got to his feet. Are you back? Yes. Zaro's gaze shifted to the box Toji was holding. Did you go out to buy that? It's yours. Huh. It's a birthday present. Zaro's eyes widened in realization, then sparkled with anticipation and interest. Thump, he sat down in front of the box. A sword? Yes. Toji carefully placed the long box on the floor. Zaro reached out to open it, frowning when it wouldn't budge. Just a moment. You can't open it because of the spell seal. Toji hurriedly took out a natural wool from the mouth of the spell, and, like before, inserted the wool into the gap of the box. Then, leveraging the wool like a lever, he lifted it to open the box. Seeing the neat and white sword inside the box, Zaro held his breath. His face, previously excited and curious, instantly turned stern, swirling with disbelief and ecstasy. Unaware of Zoro's changing expressions, Toji reinserted the wool into the spell and continued speaking. It's a fine sword. Since we skipped your last birthday, I put some extra thought into this gift happy fifth birthday. Zoro? Zoro, without responding to Toji's call, mesmerized, held the sword's handle and scabbard in both hands. Then, slowly but firmly, he drew the sword. SSSSH. The black blade emerged from the pristine white scabbard. 
Zaro, holding the familiar handle, lifted the sword in front of him. The sword seemed to welcome him, trembling slightly. Zaro knew this sword. He couldn't not know it. It's a promise. This was the sword with which he had made a vow with a friend. Whoosh. Armament hockey flowed into the black blade. The already black blade became even darker as the black aura intensified, reaching a point where it could no longer darken. Toji realized something. Zaro isn't just lightly imbued with hockey. All that armament hockey was being absorbed by the sword. Not a single drop leaked out, it was completely contained. Whoosh. Like wood soaked in oil igniting, the hockey suddenly amplified. Toji flinched instinctively at the sense danger, but just as suddenly, it extinguished as if it was a lie. Silence lingered. Zaro only stared at the sword, and Toji, sensing the aura emanating from Zaro holding the sword, dared not speak. He had thought it was a fine sword to begin with, but the atmosphere completely changed once Zoro held it. It was as if the sword existed solely for Zoro. Waito Ichimanji. What? Waito Ichimanji. That's the name of the sword. Zaro, without taking his eyes off the sword, said in a fluctuating voice. Not canon? Canon? What's that? It was written on the box. I see. Whatever that is, the name of this sword is Waito Ichimanji. Waito Ichimanji. Before Toji could fully digest the unfamiliar name, he noticed Zoro's voice was slightly trembling and white in his eyes. Could it be? Son, are you okay? Zoro didn't answer and bowed his head. Before a question of his well-being could be asked, Zoro raised his head first. Fortunately, there were no tears in Zoro's eyes. Where did you get this? This? I bought it. More precisely, he had intended to buy it, but the seller was nearly dead, so he just took the item. Toji thought about the piece of paper with the bank account number the old man had given him and frowned. He himself couldn't clearly explain why he had brought it. You bought it? Zaro asked in a voice full of disbelief. Yeah. How is that possible? This shouldn't even be here in the first place. Whoa. Upon hearing Zoro's words, the sword hummed softly. Toji was surprised, but Zoro just held the sword and smiled. Right, you're meant to be with me. At those words, the sword immediately quieted down, as if it understood Zoro. Zaro stood up with the Waito Ichimanji in hand, and began to slowly swing the sword. Without imbuing it with hockey, the sword didn't have the same destructive power as before. Or, it seemed not to. Cutting, turning to dodge, and cutting again. Zaro attacked slowly but surely, as if sparring with an imaginary opponent. Toji watched the scene intently. To an ordinary martial artist, it might not have been noticeable, but to Toji, who could see even the nuances of the air, it was clear. Zaro's swordplay was more refined than ever. The movements were the same as usual, yet much smoother and stronger. Yet, it didn't show outwardly because Zoro had perfect control over the sword. Where it would go, how much force to put into it, what trajectory to follow all of it. Is control the right word? It felt more appropriate to call it a unity. The sword and body were completely integrated. Like using his original body, the flow of attacks was as natural as water. There were no gaps. Zoro had always been superior in swordsmanship to Toji, but now he looked even more so. No matter how much Zoro grew day by day, it really was impossible to catch up. Toji smiled bitterly. Ha, ha. Sweat drops fell to the floor. Zoro, having moved intensely enough to drench his clothes in sweat in that brief period, caught his breath. Clank. Zoro sheathed the Waito Ichimanji and turned to Toji. Do you like it? Do you like it? Zoro burst out laughing. The father in front of him couldn't even imagine what he had given to Zoro. Naturally. Thank you. For a swordsman, a sword is more than just a weapon. And if that sword is one they've crafted themselves, like a black blade, then there's even less need to say. For Zaro, the way to Ichimanji transcended all of that. Really, thank you. Zaro smiled brightly. Seeing his eldest son's rare bright smile, Toji also smiled faintly. Now I just need to put this in my mouth. The smile vanished as quickly as it had appeared at the continuation of that statement. That's not possible. Huh? Why? You're actually thinking of doing that no, don't answer. Anyway, it's not possible. Toji massaged his throbbing head. His son's mind was filled with nothing but swords and family. That dawn at the tombs of the star. Haguru, a sorcerer belonging to the Time Vessel Association, moved with heavy steps within the Dark Palace. Today, he had failed the mission entrusted to him by Tenjin. The Time Vessel Association housed quite a number of sorcerers. They were tasked with escorting Tenjin, assisting him, monitoring and supporting the growth entities, and handling the affairs of the sorcerer world on behalf of Tenjin, who seldom ventured outside the palace due to the dangers involved. Haguru's mission this time was to deal with an affair of the sorcerer world. And he had failed it spectacularly. Recalling the details of the mission, Haguru clenched his teeth. Higain, to think he would commit such an outrageous act. 
Hegain had been a sorcerer at the Time Vessel Association for as long as Higuru. He was trusted by Tenjin to a great extent, assigned with significantly important tasks, such as guarding the sword possessed by Tenjin. What the sword was or why Tenjin kept it was unknown to Higuru. In fact, aside from a very few, no one knew that the object inside that enchanted box was a sword. The only person who knew the details about the sword was Tenjin, yet no one dared to ask him what it was. It had always been kept in an enchanted box, sealed with a spell that prevented anyone other than Tenjin and a person designated by him from opening it, undoubtedly signifying its value. Haguru personally thought it must be a supreme spiritual tool endowed with tremendous spells. And to think he stole the sword and fled, even killing the sorcerers of the Time Vessel Association who were in pursuit, when Haguru found Higain dead inside a sealed theater, he was furious to his core. If Higain had been alive, interrogation or something could have revealed where the sword had been taken, but a dead body couldn't speak. Fuming, Haguru soon became despondent. It was a task directly ordered by Lord Tenjin, he was terribly sorry to have disappointed him. Haguru trudged along. Even if it meant his death for this failure, he had to report back to Lord Tenjin before dying. The sorcerers standing in front of Tenjin's room stepped aside as they saw Haguru. As he entered Tenjin's room and the door closed behind him, Haguru immediately knelt down. There's no need for that. A muffled voice was heard. Instead of rising, Haguru pressed his forehead even more to the ground. I have failed to execute Lord Tenjin's command. A long silence followed. Then, a sigh was heard above Haguru's head. Let's talk face to face. Wouldn't it seem like my face is on the floor if I stayed like this? Haguru could not ignore Tenjin's words, spoken almost in jest, and lifted his head. Tenjin sat in front of Haguru with the face of a middle-aged woman, but faintly visible on her neck were wrinkles and a strange kanji, signs that Tenjin was gradually undergoing spirit transformation. The time for fusion was approaching. Have you not recovered the sword? Tenjin asked calmly. Haguru bowed his head in shame. Yes. One of the sorcerers sent for the pursuit died, and Higain was already dead when I arrived. The sword you commanded to be retrieved has disappeared along with the enchanted box it was kept in. Was Higain the murderer who killed the sorcerer? Yes. Despite thorough investigation of the scene, there were no traces of anyone else besides Higain and the dead sorcerer. The remaining traces belonged only to those two. Even with the assistance of supernatural police, checking CCTV footage and fingerprint analysis yielded only their traces. The scene itself, a long closed small cinema, had been turned into a mess by their fight, making it difficult to find any clues. Tenjin, with an inscrutable expression, said. Ensure the deceased sorcerer's family receives adequate compensation. Understood. Do you have any leads on the whereabouts of the sword? It is with great regret that I report it seems Higain intended to sell it to the enemy faction. For Haguru, this was shocking. To think of selling Tenjin's item to the enemy faction? Tenjin symbolizes Japan's sorcerer's world and owns the barrier surrounding Japan. If the sword inside that enchanted box played a crucial role in maintaining the barrier, and it had fallen into the hands of the enemy faction, the consequences would have been unimaginable. Was he attempting to sell it, or has it already been sold? I have not been able to find out. My apologies. However, it was mentioned that Higain priced it at 500 million yen, so there were hardly any buyers. There wouldn't be many instances of such a weapon appearing on the market at that price. It was claimed not to be a supreme spiritual tool. Apparently, they foolishly failed to recognize its spell. Haguru had never imagined that the sword, kept in the tombs of the star for hundreds of years and placed inside the enchanted box, was not considered a supreme spiritual tool. Tenjin picked up a teacup after a moment of silence and said, it's not a supreme spiritual tool. Excuse me? I said the sword is not a supreme spiritual tool. Haguru's face froze for a moment, then his eyes rolled vividly, filled with clear confusion. Then why did you keep the sword so carefully? With a voice full of incomprehension, Tenjin quietly said, because it is not a supreme spiritual tool. I don't understand what you mean Tenjin stood up, holding the teacup, and walked towards the window. He opened the window wide and looked out at the landscape beyond the tombs of the star. I don't even know what the sword is. Perhaps there's only one person in this world who does. Who might that be? I do not know that either. There are things even Lord Tenjin does not know? Haguru asked with a genuinely puzzled expression. Tenjin smiled bitterly at that look. I am not a god. Just a slightly larger cog in the machine. Ignorance is natural. A cog? Indeed. A cog in the wheel called the world, or causality. Tenjin did not verbalize the latter part of his thought. It was clear that the sorcerer before him, who believed Tenjin to be the pinnacle of sorcerers and that sorcerers was everything, hence regarding Tenjin as omniscient, would not understand. Tenjin did not blame him. Like Tenjin, he was just a cog within this vast mechanism. It was not strange for such a small cog to be unable to see beyond the confines of the mechanism. Naturally. 
though certainly not the owner of the sword. Tenjin leaned against a window frame. The curse cycles, Tenjin. No matter how powerful a sorcerer is born, a spirit of equal might emerges. And vice versa. Breaking this cycle is something not even you can do. Nor can I. That's why I've summoned a being capable of breaking this wretched cycle. To finally be freed from this damned prison called causality, reincarnation, or fate. The voice of an old friend, unforgettable even after nearly a thousand years, echoed in Tenjin's ears. Tenjin closed his eyes and called out his friend's name. Canon. Are you referring to the Bodhisattva of Compassion? Tenjin did not answer Haguru's question, but instead said something else. It seems the time for assimilation is drawing near. Surprise and tension spread across Haguru's face. Tenjin's assimilation was a very important event that the Time Vessel Association devoted all its efforts to. Whether Tenjin remained as a human or became a spirit depended solely on the assimilation. I will inform the growth entity and the owner of the Six Eyes. It's not time yet. I can hold on until the spring after next. The owner of the Six Eyes and the growth entity are still too young, let's wait a bit longer. So, the time for assimilation is the summer after next year? That's right. It's November 2004 now. The summer after next year would be the summer of 2006. I will make all the necessary preparations. Tenjin did not respond to Haguru's bowed head. Whether preparations were hastily made or meticulously planned, the assimilation of the growth entity would proceed. The Six Eyes and the growth entity are strongly connected by the causality of powerful sorcerers. If there's a sorcerer of the Six Eyes, in their hands it shall be, if not, a new owner of the Six Eyes will emerge and intervene, and the growth entity will ultimately assimilate. Even if the sorcerer of the Six Eyes, the growth entity, and Tenjin, all do not wish for assimilation. Tenjin, contemplating the being who might exist outside of the cycle and the vanished sword of that individual, muttered inwardly. Canon, it seems the being you've summoned has finally set foot upon this land. Whether that person possessed the power to intervene in the assimilation, and even if they did, whether they would choose to intervene or not, was unknown to Tenjin. Even if the being came from another place, that place would have its own cycles, and more importantly, by being born into this world, they might have become part of its cycles. They could change the cycle, but they might not realize it's a cycle and simply leave it be. The possibilities were endless. For whatever reason, if that person does not intervene, the assimilation will inevitably occur, and no matter what kind of being they are, the cycle will not be broken. If they do intervene, it will certainly become clear. Whether they are just another cog, or a being capable of reversing the heavens, breaking all cycles. Everything was shrouded in darkness. Though nothing was visible, Zaro walked on. Then, a white and singular path appeared. Zaro looked at the path but chose not to walk it, turning back into the darkness instead. When the white path appeared for the second time, Zaro, as before, did not walk it and turned away. The same happened the next time, and the time after that. Appearing, then turning away. Appearing, then turning away. At some point, the white path stopped appearing before Zoro. Still, Zoro kept walking. Then, he broke free. Click, clack. Sounds could be heard. Like a broken machine, something seemed caught and misallant. Brother. At Megumi's call, Zoro woke from a shallow sleep. Sitting against the wall, Zoro slowly rose to his feet. I think I had a strange dream. After his reincarnation, Zoro found himself dreaming unusually often, though he couldn't quite remember what the dreams were about. Zoro pushed the thought aside as he noticed Megumi looking at him with eager, bright eyes, clearly wanting something. Right now, taking care of Megumi was his priority. What's up? Megumi pointed with his finger at the cover of the picture book he had been reading. A giant apple with an indiscernible small animal peeking out. A mouse? Or perhaps a mole? Megumi said, Apla. Do you want an apple? Yeah. Fortunately, there were some apples left from the day before yesterday. Zaro got up and went to the kitchen. He took an apple out of the fridge, washed it clean, and placed it on the cutting board. Zaro took out a kitchen knife and began to peel the apple. Tata tatted it. The knife moved so quickly over the cutting board that it was almost invisible. The red apple skin slid off smoothly, and the white flesh of the apple was cut into pieces the size of sugar cubes. Zaro separated the small, neatly cut pieces of apple from Megumi and the larger slices, with only the skin removed for himself and Toji, placing them on a plate. He popped a large piece of apple into his mouth and chewed. Tart. It was a good thing. Despite his youth, Megumi didn't particularly like sweet things. He especially disliked sweet side dishes, like bell peppers, for example. Megumi toddled over to Zoro, eyed the apple, and swallowed his saliva. Hungry. It's almost ready, just wait a bit. Okay. Megumi wait. Megumi nodded his head vigorously. Gently stroking Megumi's tufty hair, Zoro carried two plates to the living room. He sat Megumi down in a toddler's chair that was a combination of a table and chair, and fastened a bib around his neck. 
then, he handed him a child-sized fork. As soon as Zoro placed a plate filled with neatly cut apple pieces in front of Megumi, he poked a piece of apple with the fork. When Megumi put the apple piece into his mouth, his green eyes widened in delight. Yummy. That's good to hear. Pleased that it suited his taste, Megumi kicked his legs happily while sitting. The first time Zoro had given him a fork, the outcome was messy enough to be uncertain whether the food had been eaten or just scattered on the floor, but now he had gotten quite good at eating by himself. Still spills a bit, though Zoro noticed an apple piece escaping the plate, due to Megumi's clumsy use of the fork. Looks like it's time to clean up again. Getting used to cleaning after meals when raising a child, Zoro didn't mind much. As Megumi joyfully ate his apple, he suddenly paused and picked up a piece with his fork, offering it to Zoro. Brother, ah. Uh, I've got my own. You eat? Papa too? Papa has his own too. Zaro glanced at Toji, who was lying on the living room sofa with his eyes closed. It might seem like he was asleep, but Zoro knew he was pondering something. Lately, Toji spent more time sitting or lying down, quietly thinking. Of course, his senses weren't dulled, if Megumi was about to fall, he'd catch him, and he'd respond immediately if Zoro called. But if left undisturbed, he could remain in that state for hours. Since when? It seemed to have started from the day Zoro received the Waito Ichimanji. What had happened when Toji went to buy the Waito Ichimanji? That was something Zoro didn't know. However, Zoro did know one thing. It seems like he's moved past the stage of confusion. When Zoro first asked Toji what he wanted to become, Toji clearly appeared confused and flustered. But now, he seemed to be contemplating seriously. Whether Toji had a dream or a desire, Zoro didn't particularly care. Whether it was an act of evil or something everyone thought impossible. However I just hope he doesn't take too long to decide. The reason was that Toji had stated he wouldn't train until he had defined his dream. In a world with poor public order like in their previous lives, there would be pirates or bandits everywhere for Zoro to challenge, but now Toji was his only worthy opponent. Zoro was eager to wield the Waito Ichimanji as soon as possible. Feeling the itch to use his sword, Zoro pushed the Waito Ichimanji with his thumb, slightly drawing the blade before sliding it back in. Click. The sound of the sword sliding back caught Toji's attention, snapping him out of his reverie. Zaro pricked a large apple slice with a fork and offered it to Toji, who absentmindedly accepted and ate it. Noticing Zoro, who was nearly as tall as the long cloth-wrapped sword he had belted around his waist, Toji asked with a hint of reluctance. Are you going to keep carrying that around? Yeah. Isn't it heavy? And long. Although Zoro managed to balance it well, it didn't look comfortable from any angle. Do you want to put it in the spirit realm? No. Toji didn't press further at the firm response. His son must be quite stubborn. Then at least put it somewhere in the house. You're not planning to go outside with it too, are you? I am. You're going to get arrested for carrying a blade. In this country, kids don't get punished. Plus, katanas are considered craft items, not weapons. Where did you learn that? Even if he wouldn't be punished, it wasn't good for a five-year-old to be seen walking around with a sword by everyone, especially in the crowded streets of Tokyo. Katanas are considered craft items when they're quietly placed in a display cabinet or hung on a wall at home. Walking around with one strapped to your waist like you're doing is definitely going to draw strange looks and lead to being stopped for questioning. Moreover, Zaro's sword was far too sharp to be mistaken for a mere craft item by anyone who saw it. A misstep could lead to Zoro being dragged to the police station and locked up in a cell. They needed to find a solution. Suddenly, Toji thought of an artifact he had acquired somehow, but had never really used, left neglected within the armory of his spirit realm. Ugh, Toji spat out the spirit realm from his stomach. He then pulled out a red cloth from the inflated mouth of the spirit realm. If you're going to keep wearing your sword around your waist, use this. What's this? It's an artifact. If you use this as a belt and secure the weapon to it, the weapon won't be visible to non-sorcerers. To be precise, it won't be visible to anyone who can't see the spirit realm. It was taken from a paranoid sorcerer Toji had killed in the past. That sorcerer, fearing a high-ranking spirit could appear at any time, used this belt to dangle various weapons and carried them everywhere. It was only invisible to non-sorcerers, spirits and sorcerers could see it clearly, so Toji rarely found a use for it, as his targets were usually not non-sorcerers. Toji handed the red cloth to Zoro. It won't be visible to the eye, but it can still be felt if touched by non-sorcerers, so be careful not to bump into anyone with the scabbard. And the moment you draw the weapon, it becomes visible again. Actually, Toji was more worried about Zoro encountering a sorcerer. Sorcerers were few, but in a city as populous as Tokyo, it wouldn't be strange for one or two to be among the crowds. There are enough crazies out there. If by chance a sorcerer saw Zoro and thought he had potential, scouting or even kidnapping wouldn't be out of the question. I won't let it slide if that actually happens. 
Unaware of Toji's imaginings of slicing a sorcerer trying to kidnap Zoro into pieces, Zoro accepted the cloth without hesitation. Thanks. He untied the belt he was originally using and replaced it with the one Toji handed him. The moment Zoro secured the Weido Ichimanji to the new belt, it disappeared from his sight. It was still tangible, though not visible. Zoro blinked. It really is invisible. Drawing the sword, its form reappeared to Zoro's eyes. Zoro smiled, satisfied. This could be useful. Since Zoro is still young in terms of physical age, he won't be criminally punished for carrying a sword around. However, being questioned by the police every time he carries a sword asking where he got it and where his parents are is an annoying situation for Zoro. It was better in the previous world for such things. Given how harsh the world is, no one finds it strange to see someone carrying a weapon. Of course, even there, it was rare for someone of Zoro's age to carry a weapon. Zoro fiddled with the Weido Ichimanji. He still couldn't quite believe it. He thought the connections to the swords he used in his previous life were severed forever by dying and being reborn in another world. And Menkatetsu. Are they in this world too? He hoped so, but he wouldn't be too hung up on it. It would be somewhat unsettling if not a single sword that Zoro used in his previous world remained. It felt like he left no trace in the previous world. For a swordsman, the sword itself is a will, and there was a wish that someone would inherit Zoro's swords and continue that will from the previous world. Reminiscing about his past life, Zoro couldn't help but remember some faces. Thinking of his crewmates with whom he once shared a ship and traveled the world, Zoro slightly frowned. I wonder if those guys are doing okay. Robin had Zoro's Viver card, and since she knew the whereabouts of all the other crewmates, the news of Zoro's death would have been shared with everyone without delay. What would they have done next? Came to the place of his death and recovered his body? Maybe there was nothing left to recover. It was the first time he had fought so many enemies alone. Among all the battles in Zoro's life, this was one of the most intense. It being his last battle, it might be natural. Maybe they know I've been reborn. He didn't know how a Viver card would change when someone dies and then comes back to life in another world. It might have burned up and then regenerated. Once dead, it could just disappear. Even the strongest can't know what happens after death. Zoro thought of his crewmates' faces. I hope they aren't suffering too much, either way. It's not their fault. It's just that Zoro was too weak to defeat them without dying. Zoro's expression turned a bit bitter. Toji watched the change in Zoro's expression and then extended his arm to tap Zoro on the head gently. He didn't know what was going on, but he wanted Zoro to have a happy face today, of all days, since it was his birthday. Since it's your birthday, let's eat something you like. What do you want to eat? Zoro blinked at Toji's question. Then, with a slightly excited face, he said, alcohol. No. Toji was firm, and Zoro clicked his tongue, thinking it would be allowed on his birthday. Not even a little? Not a single drop. Seeing Toji's expression, as firm as if it couldn't be penetrated by a pumpkin's tooth, Zoro decided to back down this time. It seems like it won't happen this year. In fact, Zoro was almost shocked to death when he heard that this country allows drinking from the age of 20. 20 years old, 20 years old. That's 15 years to go. Anyway, if alcohol was out of the question, he had to choose something else. After thinking for a moment, Zoro spoke up. Then, white rice with stir-fried tripe. Toji narrowed his eyes and replied, I said something you like, not me. That's what I mean. Zoro liked food that paired well with white rice and as a side dish. Tripe, which Toji loved the most, was also one of the foods that paired well as a side dish. If they were going to eat something delicious, it was better to eat something Toji also liked. That was the intention. Okay. Toji couldn't possibly not understand that sentiment. Anyway, he's a kind one. Self-centered as if he's the only one that exists, yet when it comes to choosing between himself and others, he chooses others. Even though he believes he's not worth it. Toji smiled bitterly. Have you sorted out your thoughts? Startled by the abrupt question, Toji flinched and then shook his head. As always, the moment he let his guard down, he was attacked at his weak point, typical of a prosecutor. Not yet. Hmm, but it seems better than before. Is that so? Unlike a few days ago, when he couldn't think of anything he wanted, now all sorts of memories flooded his mind. From the days he gritted his teeth vowing to destroy the Zenin family's main storage after leaving it, to the past when he spent as quickly as he earned the money from cutting off a sorcerer's life, to the moments with Xie when he dared not believe it was reality yet wished it would last forever. Some memories sharply pierced him, while others gently enveloped him. Some memories were too bright, making him not want to look at them as if he would go blind. And strangely, the words spoken by the fugitive from the Time Vessel Association last night also lingered in his mind. How could they acknowledge me when I don't acknowledge myself was that what was said? He wasn't sure why those particular words stuck in his memory, but they did. Seeing Toji pondering, Zaro shrugged his shoulders. 
Well, think about it some more. Toji was standing at a threshold right now. Whether or not to cross that threshold, and even if he decides to cross, when to do so, was entirely up to Toji. Regardless of the choice, he had no intention of giving up, not in the slightest. Zaro turned away from Toji and said, let's go buy stir-fried tripe. Me too. Megumi raised his hand excitedly. Zaro burst into laughter. Yeah, should Megumi come along too? With a heave, Zaro lifted Megumi into his arms. He gave a tight hug to maximize closeness, while ensuring it wasn't painful, adjusting his strength. Ever since reading in a parenting book that hugs should be tight enough for a child to feel the affection clearly, Zaro always hugged Megumi like that. Megumi, held by Zaro, giggled brightly. His face, strikingly resembling Toji's, was filled with the brightness and innocence characteristic of a child raised with abundant love. Toji, looking at Megumi's face, remembered a young sorcerer from the Zenin family who ran towards Nabito with a bright face. What was his name, Na something? Na something anyway, that kid strangely didn't despise Toji, but instead followed him around, but since he was a Zenin, Toji had no reason to think well of him. Not just that kid, Toji disliked seeing any sorcerer from the Zenin family smile. However, he couldn't feel the same about Megumi. Watching Megumi smile, Toji suddenly thought of the sorcerers he had seen until now. Most sorcerers don't have bright expressions, but very rarely, there were those who smiled like Megumi. They were mainly young sorcerers from the Jujutsu High. Toji had killed sorcerers of that age without any pangs of conscience. Were their smiles so different from Megumi's? No, they weren't. A question naturally followed. Then, why did I kill even those kinds? For money? That couldn't be it. For Toji, money was something that came and went, and even if it was gone, he could quickly earn it back. A few jobs and the money swelled rapidly, and even if he earned a lot, it would all be gone in a few days due to gambling. Though he gambled to multiply his money, Toji wasn't a fool to truly believe he could increase his wealth through gambling. After all, money held little value to Toji. Then, why was it? How could they acknowledge me, when I don't acknowledge myself? The voice that had been scratching at his brain, lingering in his memories, echoed in his head once more. At that moment, Toji realized. Did I wish to be acknowledged by sorcerers? When he was very young, Toji wanted to become strong. Strong enough to defeat curses with his bare hands, to surpass Jinichi, who was a sorcerer. Strong enough to beat the previous family head. Why? Because then, it seemed like he would be acknowledged. His strength, his existence. Because it seemed like he could belong in the world of sorcerers. Because there, it seemed like he could laugh together with them. However, the first sorcerers Toji encountered as he was born and raised, especially those bearing the Zenin surname, never accepted his strength or existence. They constantly rejected and despised him. A monkey. No cursed energy at all. How could such a creature come from the noble Zenin bloodline? A disgrace to the Zenin. Such a failure was born. It would have been better if he wasn't the head's child. If he wasn't a direct descendant. It would have been better if such a thing hadn't been born at all. Can't we kill him now? Yes, let's kill him. Put him in the storage. This time, lock the door tightly and kill him. Disgusting, terrible, shameful. Ominous, ominous, ominous. Hearing such words as if they were natural, Toji Zenin struggled to live. Even when he was caught scavenging the kitchen for food and got stepped on, when his mouth was torn by a curse's claws, when the drunk previous head tried to slit his throat with a knife, he desperately survived. He survived. As time passed, Toji became stronger, but still, in front of the Zenin, he was nothing but a monkey. He wasn't even treated as human. Around that time Toji realized. No matter how strong he became, no matter what he did Toji Zenin would never be acknowledged by the Zenin. From the moment he realized that, Toji began to hate all sorcerers. He hated every sorcerer who belonged to that world he could never reach, simply because they were born with a body possessing cursed energy. And so, he began killing them under the pretext of making money. Even you, who belong to that world, end up being killed by a monkey like me who couldn't even step foot in it. He felt a degrading sense of satisfaction from that. For the first time in his life, Toji coldly reflected on his emotions and actions. Was it right to have killed sorcerers as an assassin, fueled by his anger towards the Zenin? No, it wasn't. It was wrong. The inferiority complex he harbored because he was despised by the sorcerers of the Zenin family. The indiscriminate hatred towards sorcerers that stemmed from it. And even his actions of resolving it through the murder of sorcerers. It was a huge mistake. For the first time in his life, Toji straightforwardly acknowledged his own distortion. The moment he acknowledged it, an unbearable shame and pitifulness flooded Toji's inner self. There was a defiance wanting to deny it, but even that succumbed to the cold logic. Toji squirmed. Just as the familiar self-loathing was about to engulf him, Zaro firmly grabbed Toji's hand. Holding Megumi in one arm and firmly holding Toji's hand with the other, Zaro looked up at Toji. 
Zoro stared directly into Toji's eyes, which were surely shaking with aimlessness, as if he knew all of Toji's sins. Even though there was no way he had the power to read minds with his willpower. Father. A quiet call came. It was a cold voice, closer to reprimand than comfort. Yet, Zoro stood by his side without letting go of his hand. You. Do you still call me father, even when I'm like this? The moment he murmured that to himself, Toji realized the meaning of the dagger Zoro had given him as a birthday present. Was it a reason not to let go? By giving him that dagger, Zoro had an excuse to come to Toji's aid. Because one must keep any promise, regardless of who it is made with. Even if Toji were to leave Zoro in Megumi's side, even if he became something worse than a curse and committed all kinds of evil deeds, even if he faced a just-deserved fate that others, if they were strangers, would not even glance at, saying he got what he deserved, Zoro seemed to have wanted to fight alongside Toji at least once. And wanted to catch him once more. Zoro didn't trust Toji, but he loved him. Too many words rose to Toji's throat, but in the end, he couldn't utter any of them, and only let out a faint groan. He didn't want to make him regret. He wanted to make him believe. Even as a father who is a complete mess, because his son does not let go of his hand. Toji, who has ruined many things, did not want to ruin his sons as well. So to ensure Zoro's choice wasn't wrong, to not spoil the happiness of Megumi, who smiles brightly. I need to become better. Definitely. He must face his shame, pitifulness, and sins, and improve, just like now. Again and again. Toji closed his eyes. What I want. Once, he desired the recognition of sorcerers, of the Zenin. That's why he desired cursed energy. He harbored the hope that with that power, he might belong to the world he longed for, even if it was late. Or perhaps, he thought he could completely trample them and prove himself. But now, such things didn't matter anymore. The people Toji wanted recognition from were not sorcerers, and the place he wished to belong to was not the sorcerer world. It's these kids. He wanted to be acknowledged by his children and wanted to be by his children's side. Without any guilt, apology, inferiority, or shame. Toji closed his eyes, then opened them again. His eyes were still shaking, but at least he was looking forward. A flicker of interest appeared in Zoro's eyes. Just a little, but his father had just crossed a threshold. Have you finally decided? Yes. What is it? I won't tell you. Why? I'll tell you after I've achieved it a little. Guilt, apology, inferiority, shame. Since he hasn't yet shaken off any of these. Toji firmly grasped Zoro's small hand. Then, together with Zoro, he took a step forward. The day after Zoro's birthday, Zoro and Toji went to the training ground together for the first time in a while. As usual, Zoro held two wooden swords and had the Waito Ichimanji strapped to his waist, though he seemed to have no intention of drawing it. Toji, as always, faced Zoro barehanded, holding the wooden swords. However, the outcome was not as usual. He's aiming for the left. Toji stepped to the right in advance, dodging the attack. Zoro's wooden sword whooshed through the air where Toji had been just a moment before. Zaro immediately followed up with another attack, but again, Toji accurately predicted the direction of the swing, and twisted his body in the opposite direction. Right, down, right, up, left. Then up again. Toji managed to dodge all of Zoro's attacks, moving at a speed similar to Zoro's. It was a strange feeling, even for Toji himself. What is this? It wasn't judgment based on enhanced senses like before. It just felt, and just knew. A bizarre power that seemed to predict where the opponent would go next. If anything, it was most similar to intuition. But that wasn't all. Even though they were wooden swords, being swung by Zoro who could infuse them with armament hockey, meant that getting hit could feel as if the hit area was about to burst open, even for Toji. But today, it doesn't feel like it's going to burst. At most, it felt like getting a bruise. Anyway, it was a bit less painful. Finally. Zoro, who had been closely observing Toji's movements throughout the spar, had his eyes shine brightly. It was the moment the past year's efforts finally showed results. Then, it's time to start hitting harder. Caught up in the sudden, mysterious power he had acquired, Toji paused in the middle of the spar to contemplate. It was just a few seconds, but for Zoro, that was enough time. Suddenly feeling another strange intuition, Toji urgently said to Zoro. Don't do it. He wasn't sure exactly what Zoro was about to do. But it seemed like it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Of course, Zoro wasn't exactly the son who listened well to his father, so he ignored Toji's words and drew the Waito Ichimanji from its sheath, holding it in his mouth. Click. Toji grimaced suddenly. He had clearly told him not to do it because he could lose a tooth. And the kid still had baby teeth. He quickly approached Zoro. You, I told you not to do that swoosh. Suddenly, Zoro swiftly swung his sword towards Toji's upper body. Toji had to stop speaking and dodge immediately. Whoosh. The ground where the sword passed was gouged out by the sword strike. 
The hockey enveloping the three swords was much more formidable than before. To Toji's astonishment, Zoro, with the sword in his mouth, said, Sorry, father. I have my reasons to use three sword style. He felt like he was going to die of itching. And for good reason, Zoro had not handled a real sword for too long. He hadn't fought with all his might in too long, and it had been too long since he had the opportunity to showcase his unique skills. There were those he faced on his fourth birthday, but they were too weak and died quickly. Of course, Toji was a sufficiently strong opponent, but the lack of hostility shown by Zoro and his apparent concern for potentially injuring Toji made the fight lackluster. If Toji really went all out, Zoro would be the one to get hurt, so he couldn't complain. For Zoro, a swordsman who pursues strength and enjoys fighting more than anything, a fight where he couldn't give his all was truly a torment. But now, the situation has changed. Zoro had acquired three swords. Now that three sword style was possible, even if completely defending against Toji's attacks was difficult, he could somewhat counter them. Especially since Toji was on the verge of awakening his hockey, Zoro wanted to take this opportunity to fight with all his might and potentially help awaken Toji's hockey. Simply put, it was a dissatisfaction with his desire for combat. The corners of Zoro's mouth lifted. His heart throbbed with anticipation. Hold on. Or fight back. Wait a second boom. As soon as he finished speaking, Zoro rushed forward eagerly. Surprised, Toji quickly dodged, creating a considerable distance between them. Boom. Zoro leaped high into the air, striking the void with his wooden sword. As Toji's eyes widened, Zoro, holding a wooden sword in each hand and flipping them behind his back, shouted, Tiger Hunt. Before he could even think, Toji's body sprang backwards. Zoro's wooden sword struck down, and the ground shattered in a pattern resembling tiger stripes, sending debris flying in all directions. He didn't hit. The problem is still speed. Zoro clicked his tongue, getting up from the cratered ground. How did you just I hit the air with the sword and used the impact to jump? That's possible? It was a method beyond Toji's imagination. Seeing Toji's dumbfounded expression, Zoro shrugged. There are also ways to do it just with physical abilities. Like Geppo. Zoro muttered words that made no sense to Toji and smirked. I'll teach you later. I can't do it myself though. Zoro had only seen others perform those techniques but hadn't managed to replicate them himself. Well, he roughly knew the principle anyway. But for now, focus on me. If you're not careful, even if you're my father, you could get hurt. Zoro charged again. Toji was more worried about Zoro's teeth than about hockey or anything else. I need to end this quickly. First, I need to make him spit out that sword, then scold him or continue the sparring. Leaping back to create distance, Toji vomited a curse tool from his stomach. Then, he pulled out the playful cloud from the mouth of the curse tool. Among the many weapons, he chose Playful Cloud specifically because other weapons were not suitable for subduing. Toji, who usually wielded Playful Cloud, was surprised by the eerie energy emanating from it. It's not that he couldn't feel cursed energy at all usually. Toji's superhuman body could sense cursed energy, even though it was something that was never supposed to be accessible to him. But now was different. It was as if he could feel every movement of the cursed energy, swirling like flames. Could this be the observation hockey? Don't let your guard down, father. Clash. Playful Cloud swung a moment too late collided head-on with the Waito Ichimanji. Zoro swung his sword. Clang. 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 The Waito Ichimanji and Playful Cloud clashed, intertwining cursed energy and armament hockey. Toji's expression hardened. Playful Cloud is being pushed back. At the moment the two weapons collided, it was evident that Playful Cloud's cursed energy scattered in all directions, its power dissipating. It was a slight but clear disadvantage for Playful Cloud. He knew it was a good sword, but he hadn't expected Playful Cloud, a special grade curse tool, to be outmatched in power. And Zoro's movements. Just adding one more sword to use, and even wielding it in his mouth. Naturally, movements using a sword held in the mouth should be simpler and less effective than those with hands, but that wasn't the case. As the two swords in his hands moved, the one in his mouth blocked any retreat. Whichever way you go, you get cut. Crash. Crack. Instead of devastating his own shoulder, Toji sweated as he saw the wooden sword tear through the floor. The power is different. Toji thought that distributing the hockey he would normally concentrate into two swords among three would weaken it, but that was not the case at all. Zoro had never been an easy opponent for even a single moment, but Zoro using three swords presented a different kind of pressure. Moreover, Toji was not in a particularly calm state at the moment. Everything is visible. Like sleeping with his eyes open, he could see everything that shouldn't be visible. It wasn't just a matter of eyesight. No matter how good Toji's eyesight was, he couldn't see what was happening behind his head. Now, he could. 
The dark cursed energy of playful cloud, the cursed energy within the cursed storage vessel and the curses stored within it, the movement of Zoro's sword and hockey, even the sound of sweat droplets falling from Toji's body to the floor. There was so much information that his mind went numb. Three sword style dragon twister. Dangerous. Toji, having preemptively caught on to that information, unconsciously drew playful cloud. Crack. The clash of playful cloud's cursed energy and the hockey infused sword strike tore both apart. The sword strike generated from the tip of the sword overwhelmed Toji. Toji raised his right arm in defense. At that moment, black hockey wrapped around both of Toji's arms. Seeing this, Zoro hesitated, and Toji did not miss this opportunity. Swoosh. Blood flowed from the arm wrapped in armament hockey. Ignoring it, Toji charged and swung Playful Cloud. Clash. Clash. Playful Cloud sent the two wooden swords Zoro was holding flying. As Zoro staggered from the impact, Toji grabbed Zoro by the collar to prevent him from falling. Almost simultaneously, Zoro, who had been holding the Weido Ichimanji in his mouth, grabbed it with his hand and swung. The cool aura of metal brushed against Toji's neck. But Toji was intense. After all, it was the back of the blade. And for Zoro, there was no longer any hostility. It wasn't something he saw. He just knew. Zoro, seeing Toji's pitch black hand holding his collar, grinned. Then, he sheathed the Weido Ichimanji that had been pointed at Toji's neck with the flat side. Congratulations, father. You've obtained hockey. It was the simultaneous awakening of observation and armament hockey. Toji slowly blinked his green eyes. Then, startled, he withdrew the armament hockey from his hand and carefully set Zoro down on the ground. Sorry, sorry. I couldn't control it. Are you hurt, did you get? Seemed a bit dazed yet sensitive. Were you in a heightened state? It was a common occurrence when first awakening observation hockey. Becoming overly immersed in the situation of the opponent, overwhelmed by emotions. In Toji's case, it seemed he was immersed in the situation of the battle. It's okay. You just need to learn how to control it. Given that Toji's senses were already sharp, awakening observation hockey might have added to his confusion. Considering that, he did relatively well. He didn't go berserk and attack me without recognizing me, right? After all, he didn't inflict even a scratch. Zoro thought so and brushed it off as no big deal. Toji mumbled and then sighed deeply. The kid was alarmingly fearless. Even though his father, someone who could crush him, had grabbed his collar, he remained calm. Toji looked at Zoro's neatly aligned teeth and then said, hand over the sword. Let's go to the dentist first. The conversation would continue from there. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.